All parties in the matter of Corville versus Corville. Step forward, please. Tina Corville is suing her estranged daughter-in-law, Jennifer Corville, for an unpaid loan and car insurance payments. Jennifer says Tina's son is a deadbeat. This is the son? Yes, ma'am. And this is your soon-to-be ex-daughter-in-law. It is yes. your claim that while she and your son were living in your home, you made a series of loans to her. Yes, Joanna. Ms. Corville says that you made gifts to her because she was the only one working in her family. Your son wasn't working, so she needed some car payments made in order to get her back and forth to work and some insurance payments made on the car. I have a few questions. Yes, Joanna. How old are you? 25. What do you do for a living? I'm unemployed at the moment. How long have you been unemployed? For not that long because I had a job January 1st whenever I had put her out. Listen because... to me. Listen to me. How long have you been unemployed? Since January 1st. Of 2007? Yes, ma'am. Prior to January 1st, 2007, your mother says that you weren't working a good part of the no, time. That's what your mother says. Yes, Is she lying? That's true. No, ma'am, that's true. How long did you have the January job? Not long because I didn't even Just go don't off... tell me because. No, ma'am, I hadn't gone offshore. It was an offshore job, and I didn't have a ride to go offshore. That's why I didn't have that job. I hadn't so you didn't have day. a job? I had the job. I got hired. When was I the took... last time that you got a paycheck, Mr. Corbell? I Corvel? didn't get a paycheck from them because I never worked one day. Mr. Corbell, I, didn't have I want a ride. you to listen to put on your listening ear, sir. Okay. When was the last time, month and year, that you had? a paycheck think hard 2006 and I can't give you the exact month well give me close to the okay. exact month um, about the 10th month or maybe even the ninth. what would that be the ninth month the ninth month yeah is um, September took me a while good September now in August who did you work for Pizza Hut doing what delivery driver how long did that last not long why because I was told I couldn't use the car to do it no more. I was putting wear and tear on our car. Your Honor, that was our car at the time. I was a manager at Pizza Hut. Listen, you know what kind of sympathy I have for you? Zero. You picked him. And not only did you pick him, but you picked him. And you have a child. No. Okay. I was just clarifying it. You know, put your hand down. Sometimes it's better to be alone. Sometimes the loneliest you can be is when you're with somebody. Yep. Your son, who was without a job, moves in with you, with his wife and her child. Yes, ma'am. How old was he when he left home? He's been in, uh, in and out of home since he's 12 years old. In and out of your home? Yes, ma'am. Now, how did you feel about it when he told you he was getting married? Didn't know the girl long enough. But she has a job, right? Yeah. At the time, she did have a job, yes, ma'am. Now, your son had no job at the time. At the time? At yeah, the time? He, at the time, he did have a job. He Doing were, what? He did sheet metal. What happened to that job? He had differences with the guy. Yeah, the guy fired me because I asked for a raise. And what did he say when you asked him for a raise? He told me he didn't feel that I deserved it, and if I felt like I really needed it, I could go look for a job elsewhere because I no longer had one with him. No, that's not what he said. Yes, he said, if I don't feel as if you deserve it, if you feel as if you deserve more, go elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. Well, he didn't say that you can't have a job with him. He said, go elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. And so you went elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. Where'd you go? To Pizza Hut. Was that paying more than your sheet metal job? Yes, ma'am. Nah. With the tips, yes, no. ma'am. Okay. Now, tell me about this first loan. After they got married, they moved in with you because he's not working, right? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Were they paying rent in your house? Not at the beginning, no. Were they paying rent later? Uh, when the second go around, they were going to pay rent. They moved in twice this year, last year. Fine. Well, the second time they moved in, did they pay rent? One month. How much? 150. And who paid the rent? My son. What was he doing? He was working for Trim. Newcom. Yeah. What happened to that job? We had went and we had a court date for me and her both to attend to, and we asked the What kind of court date? I uh, don't really remember, to be honest with you. You had a court date you don't remember? That's what kind of court date did you have? It was actually court for his paternity test. Yeah. It wasn't nothing to do with me. But for we a paternity, like... quiet. For a paternity test for what? His second child. He has children? Yes, ma'am. Wunderbar. He has two, one for two different women. Now. How much money in total did you give Miss Corville? Nine hundred and fifty-eight dollars. Tell me what it was for. In January. January of what? Of 2006. She bought a car with her income tax. Didn't have money for the insurance, so I loaned her two hundred. Just a second. Just a second. Tell me about what she didn't have money for the insurance, and she said to you she would pay me back. Did you have that discussion with her or with your son? With her. 
Tell me about the discussion. She said that she would help us give us the money because of the fact he was out of work and she didn't want to see us without a core because if we didn't have a core, we were unable to work. Was, he working, said, was he working at the time? No, ma'am. Did you subsequently get a job, sir? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you did? Good. Where did you get a job? That's um, whenever I went to the electrical company. And how did you get to the electrical company? She had brought me a few occasions. Who did? Miss Jennifer. Your wife? My wife, yes, ma'am. What's next? In May, she called me at work crying because she had a payday loan that she had taken before they were married, crying because she was going to get arrested. Could she please borrow some money? Is that right? It is. Um, Good. How much was that? Three oh five. Eighty. Eighty. That you owe her. Go ahead. Then in September the 19th, their ABC insurance canceled. So they had to find new insurance. They had to find new insurance. She had to find new insurance. Where right were now. you working? You told me you were working in September, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's when we were both working at Newcom. Oh, okay. So you were both working. Yes, ma'am. And you were using her car to get there. Yes, ma'am. Ah, good. Perfect. So she, I paid her down payment for $155. That's for fine. The Geico. That ensures that your son is working. She was short $100 because they both lost their jobs. She was short $100, so she, to keep her car, I put the $100 difference in pay that she would pay me to find another Why'd job. Why'd you get him to pay you some money? It wasn't his car. He was using it. They were a married On couple. Okay. No. no. Listen, Miss Corville, Miss Corville, I had lost your son put her out of the house when? January 1st, 2007. Why? Why? Because what was I, my question? I couldn't use the car to go find a job, nothing. She had stopped letting me use the car, everything. I, that was her Really? Car. And you had been using the car to go and look for a job? No, ma'am. Well, you said she me. stopped yeah, letting like you Yeah, like she it. hadn't let me. And within three months since we had been back over there, I had got a job and went to Homer. That was the only time. So that's why you threw her out? Yes, ma'am, because I was oh, supposed to be God. leaving to go offshore and she wouldn't well, bring me. Go ahead. He didn't get a job in Homer. He actually went to Homer to get a job. He failed his drug test and he was unable to work offshore. <sighs> So he actually didn't What work. kind of drugs were you taking that you failed the drug test? None. You mean that the test was a mistake? No, ma'am. I was going offshore. So you didn't fail the drug no, test? No, ma'am. Would you like to take one today? Doesn't matter. <laughs> she owes you for the payday loan. That she owes you for. For the car, consider it a contribution to your son. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Good. Judging for the plaintiff in the amount of 30580. That's all. Thank you very much. All these are excused. You may step out. I hope I did uh, hear the end of it. Um, Judge Judy sure did fill me with some justice. If that's what she wants to believe, let her live in her land. I don't care. And I hope that I never hear from these people. Karen Ernest is suing her nephew, 26-year-old Nicholas Kennedy, for a loan to get his Mustang fixed. Mr. Kennedy, this is your aunt? Yes. That's your mother's sister? Yes. Parents are dead? Yes. Your aunt tells me that you inherited a lot of money. I inherited a trust fund from my grandmother when she passed away. You still have the money? My aunt is in control of my trust fund, yes. How old are you? 26. How much money do you get from the trust fund? Uh, it was a total of $50,000. So how much income do you get from that every year? I actually do not know, Judge. My aunt is in full control of it. She's the trustee of the trust fund until I'm Well, 35. there has to be income that's paid out periodically how much income is paid out to him uh, judge Judy due to uh, financial issues with Nicholas over the uh, past few years um, before the passing of uh, his grandmother I sat down with her and her attorney and uh, we came up with an idea that the only way that Nicholas will ever have any money in the future was to set the age limit of 35 for him to get the money and the income is reinvested yes ma'am all right this is what the case is about I just have to get a little bit of a picture of the family. You don't mind, Miss Ernest, do you? No, Judge. Because one gets the sense from reading these papers that you adored him and he disappointed you. You made him, according to you, a loan to have his car fixed and he promised he would pay you back? Yes. It was a relatively small loan. Very small. So I don't think that it's the money necessarily that's the issue. You're absolutely right. It's the principal. Right. And he hasn't paid you back? Not a day. When did you take the money from your aunt to fix the car? It was in the uh, end of July, beginning of August of, of 2006. This, what was wrong with your car? The, uh, the rotors, the heat shield, and the calipers were completely shot, as well as the bearings. Um, it basically sounded like it was a bag of tin cans in the back of my okay. car. What kind of work do you do, Mr. Kennedy? I'm a blackjack dealer at a casino in, in central New York. Do you have a gambling problem? No. you have a drug problem? No. How long have you been a blackjack dealer? Two years. You get paid reasonable money? Roughly 30000 a year. You support anyone other than yourself? I have my daughter to support, yes. How old is she? Two years old. 
Does she live with you? No. How much do you send her for support? Uh, three. Current? Yes. Do they take it out of your pay? Yes. Ah, uh, that's why you come. Good. So how come do you were in such dire straits that you needed money from your aunt? At the time, my wife and I were talking about a separation, and I spoke with my aunt. My aunt has very di a great deal of dislike for my wife, and she was very happy at the sound of my wife and I separating. At the time, and I was... Did she dislike her because of things that you've told her about your wife? No. She just decided that she didn't like her on her own? Yes, I, guess, I believe something happened way back in the beginning in 2002 when we first got together and things just kind of escalated from there. Whose fault was it without going into the story? I really don't know. I don't, I don't even know all the details myself. Go ahead. So? I was in some financial trouble. And Why? I was only working part-time at that point and I needed some assistance with getting the separation going and when I spoke to my aunt about the separation she told me she'd help me in any other way she could possibly help me. And I also has she done that before? Yes, she has. So she's been supportive of you since you were born? Correct. And I mentioned to her that my, I was having car problems, but I didn't have the money to fix my car at that time. She then offered to help me get my car fixed. Not once did she tell me that this was a loan or that I'd have to pay her back, just that she would help me get my car fixed so that I could have it back on the road. It was my only vehicle. My wife had her own vehicle at the time as well. Now, when did she ask you for the money back, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, since then, I've only had one or two conversations with her in six months, and about a couple of weeks ago, out of the blue, I got a letter. When, for the first time, did she ask you for the money back? She has not asked me for the money back. Is that right, Miss Ernest? Incorrect. Go ahead. I made numerous uh, telephone calls to Nicholas, uh, his only cell phone that he had, and he never returned any calls whatsoever. Tell me about the conversation that you had with him in either July or August. Um, initially, I was contacted by Nicholas uh, August 1st, 2006. He says that he has problems with his car. It's the only vehicle he has to get to work, and he can't afford to get it fixed. I told him I want nothing to do with trying to help him anymore. because Why? Tell me why. Just so many financial issues in the past. Um, him and his wife have a bankruptcy already on them, six months into the marriage. Um, they, they just can't rub two nickels together. They can't save a dime, and uh, I, I didn't believe he was going to have any way to pay me back. So it's a lost cause. He begged and pleaded with me that he really needs to have his car fixed. It's the only way he can get to work. During that conversation, he also stated that they were in, in the process of selling their home and separating, that they were closing the end of August, and he promised out of the closing of the house that he would pay me back. Did you sell your house? Yes, I did. When? It was in the end of August. How much equity did you have in your house? We sold just the house, the furniture. We took all the furniture with us, but the house itself sold for $32,000. That doesn't give me the answer. How much equity did you have in the house? Did you have a mortgage? No. So you had $32,000? Correct. Where's the money? We used the money to pay back uh, my wife's car loan, and then the rest of the money we invested into a new, a, a new apartment for us getting new furniture, getting ourselves reset up. What did you need new furniture for? The furniture we had was completely destroyed. What do you mean it was destroyed? Was there a hurricane? No, my daughter. Oh, you mean so it, it was destroyed by a two-year-old? Yeah. It was destroyed <laughs> by a two-year-old. Mr. Kennedy, you sound ridiculous, sir. <laughs> two-year-old. You sound ridiculous. Does your wife work? No. Probably. Are you back together again? No. When did that change? Um, we Yesterday? Started no, we started working on things, and uh, right now it's just kind of a rocky relationship. Right now it's just for my daughter. So when you bought the new furniture, who moved, moved into this apartment with the new furniture? We moved in together, and I resided there for five days before I moved out. Something had to happen, Mr. Kennedy. See. I began seeing one of my coworkers. Oh, so you sold the house. Whose house was it, yours, or was it the family house? Um, it was the money from my inheritance from my mother's passing. Fine. Because I gather from your rent, which I sort of believe that you can't rub two nickels together. So you got a little inheritance. You bought a house. Let me follow this. With the money that you got, you bought a house. You sold the house. You took the $32,000. You paid off your wife's car. Correct. How much was that? 14000 Then you bought new furniture because the two-year-old destroyed the furniture. Correct. <laughs> and you bought new furniture, put it in an apartment. Mm hmm Brand new apartment, you spent the rest of the money, twenty thousand dollars, twenty, you know, eighteen thousand dollars, and you bought new furniture, moved into an apartment that you lived in for five days because you started fooling around with a co-worker. Correct. 
How much was the car payment? $649.61. Judge Judy, may I um, get the correct calculations of his inheritance totals? Yeah, she's, your aunt says that you got a lot more money than that, Mr. Kennedy. She said it was more like about $150,000 that you blew. She's correct. That was the original inheritance from my mother. How long ago? That was back in 2004. Mr. Kennedy, you have to grow up, sir. Your aunt is finished with you. So you're now your wife is driving around in a brand new car. You are no longer together. Is that so far correct? Are you now with the co-worker? Yes. Ah, oh, perfect. I just want to cry, Judge Judy. Listen. I love you. Some grow up, some don't grow up. You have to know the difference between things you can change and things that you can't. That doesn't mean that you don't love him. That means that if he needs a kidney, you may have to give it to him. But if he needs any money, let him get another job. <laughs> That's easy, you know? I mean, you may have to give him an organ one day because you love him. I did tell him no m multiple times in the conversation on the phone. He, yeah, he can't, you know. I mean, he can't keep tapping into to other people to clean up the mess after him. He's 26 years old. In the scheme of things, in a man's life anyway, that's still very young, you know. If they're going to grow up at all, it usually takes about 50 years. But <laughs> and then it's a downhill slide. But he's got a way to go. His grandma got smart in, in holding the trust till he's 35 years old. Because he'll go through 50,000 like water through a goose. <laughs> right? Good. Yes. Okay, judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $649.61. That's all. Thank you. Oh, nice. mm -hmm. The family needs to just still stick together no matter what happens. But then again, he shouldn't be keep using me as an ATM. My relationship with my aunt has just gone so far south, and uh, I, I'd like to repair it at some point. His ex was simply obviously a gold digger. We just went through it way too fast. We just we didn't know how to save it. We didn't know how to use it right. When he's gone, so is she. Isn't that uh, funny? I just hope we can work on our work on our relationship. And, and Mac McDonald says his friend's estranged husband, Mike Padani, assaulted him in the parking lot at his work. Mr. McDonald, your complaint alleges that he owes you twenty nine twenty nine. There's no question you're going to get that. I was just gratuitously throwing in that you're entitled to pain and suffering as well. Mr. Padani is lucky that he didn't spend six months in jail for assault. I mean, it's over. It's over. It's over. Time to move on. Time to move on. Yep. You moved on once. You survived. Move on again. You're going to move on again. And believe me, how old are you? 41. 41. You're a baby. I got a son 42 years old. He's never been married once. <laughs> You're looking for wife number three. Tell me your secret. <laughs> <laughs> Judging for the plaintiff in the amount of $2,929. That's all. Thank you. Parties are excuse me. Step out, sir. Wait here, sir. Out the back door to you. Right? It did feel good. But then, of course, he got out of the truck and hit me. No, I didn't hit him back. I apologized to him right after I did hit him. He's always been very possessive. Well, they've been kind of messing around for a while now. The defendant does have an anger issue. When he was saying that I spoke to his wife, I actually ran into her at a bar, and she was telling me that's why they got divorced, because of those two. He and his first wife had issues, so I think he just kind of carried it over into... Made two loans to your wife. Mm -hmm. You want those two loans repaid. Yes. You also claim that when she moved out of a house that you own, she took property that did not belong to her. Correct. She had been living in a house that you purchased at some point after the divorce mm -hmm. in order to give your wife and daughter a home. She had what you term a rent-to-buy situation with the home. Correct. She was supposed to make the payments on the mortgage. Subsequently, you claim that she failed to maintain the house. You took possession of the house. And when she moved out, she took property from the house of certain appliances and things that belonged to you. Correct. The former wife says that you did, in fact, make one loan to her for some bills. That loan was repaid with certain small cash payments and a pool table that she gave you in exchange for the rest of the money. The second loan that you made to her was really not a loan, which was something that had to do with the line of credit that you had on the house. And since now you have the house, it's your problem. And the property that was taken from the house was hers. That's your defense? Yes. Okay. When was the first loan and why? Mr. Roadcap. The first loan was in November of 2005, and it was for $1,855. And it was because she had gotten... Behind in her bills. Behind. Quite. She had just resigned from the job that she had. Did she call you? Yes. And what mm -hmm. did she say when she called you? She needed money 
to catch up on some of the bills and to um, get the kids Christmas gifts. What arrangements did you make for repayment? She had notified me that when she got her tax check back at the first of the year that she would pay me in full then. What happened when you got your tax check back, Ms. Adams? That wasn't the agreement at all. The $2,000 that I had borrowed from Daniel, he actually got it from a separate um, line of credit that he had for a bank that he used. Or, um, I don't make stored. things more complicated than they are. You borrowed $2,000. Mm -hmm. He says $1,855. You say $2,000. It's, those are two separate loans, Your Honor. I'm talking about the $1,855 loan. The $1,855 came from that um, home equity line of credit. I paid that every month myself. That was part of our rent-to-own agreement for the house. That was actually my bill. It was never meant to be repaid to him. I paid that $130 a month for as long as I lived in the home. Just a second. $1,855 in November of 2005. Mm -hmm. And you say that you totally paid for that loan from your home equity line of credit. Completely paid for. I paid it. Um, well, I paid seven payments. That he knows of five payments I paid on it. So he's actually asking for 1833 when he knows that I paid at least five of those payments already. Well, just show me. I don't have that with me. Well, this is where you need it, madam. Um, this is where you need it. This is yes. court. This yes. is what you're coming for. All you have to do is show me that. After November 5th, on this revolving line of credit mm -hmm. that you had, you made payments. Show me. If, if he has, um, I don't know. Not he, he your check. Well, there should be some kind of proof to say in when is the last payment I paid in the house. Miss Adams. I don't have that. Miss Adams, all I want are your checks. I don't have it with me. Well, it's unfortunate. $1,855. When was the next loan? That was at the end of November, which was eleven twenty-eight, and that was $2,000. What was that for? That was, I didn't have the money all at once, so I had to um, isolate and get two different loans. Here's the uh, no. copies of the checks. She acknowledges that you gave okay. her that money. $3,855. Mm -hmm. How much was repaid? She made $80. She made December and January, so it was two payments made on the $80. And the home equity line of credit was late January, February, and not at all in March. And she tried to make it again late in April. And it was, it was too late then. By then, the home equity line of credit was already, um, she defaulted. She made two payments. Is that correct? On the $2,000, yes, ma'am. What about on the 1855? She made three payments. So that's within, five altogether correct. of yes, 160. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, what else? At the time, we had a property agreement that she had to rent to own. She defaulted on her contract. So at that time, I took over the payments and she had till June the 1st to get the house and everything in her name, and she did not do that. So July the 1st, she had to move out, which I asked her if she didn't want to move out, she could have rented it, but she chose not to. At that point, she left July the 1st, and she left the house like this. Can I, I see it, please? I took eight truckloads of trash out of the house. It is a... Um, there was nothing left in the house when I moved out of the house. Including the refrigerator. Shh, 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 shh. How many children do you have, Miss Adams? three children. Only one of them is yours? Correct. How old are the other two children? Um, my oldest will be 13 this month. And I have a 10 year old son. Are they living with you? Um, not at this time. Who do they live with? Well, my oldest daughter, for about six months now, has lived with her father in California. And, my, well, my son, I guess he is, is with my mom since Daniel took the house. Okay, the house is a mess. Who bought the appliances? I did. Here's the receipts for them. I yeah. have two receipts. Can I see the I have two receipts because I can't measure. And I had to take one refrigerator back, it didn't fit. So I have. And, Your and Honor, um, I also have a copy here of the refrigerator I purchased when I bought the house. The house was brand new. It didn't have appliances in it when I first bought it, or got it from him. And it had no I had appliances. to purchase those things. Just a second. It had no appliances? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, it didn't have refrigerators. It did have a stove, which was accidentally taken from the movers on the last day. I've mentioned to Daniel that he can go get it. It's in the storage building. He doesn't want that. He'd much rather keep me in court over and over Shh, again. Just a second. Why did you take the stove if you didn't buy it? I had told the movers, um, it was just some friends of mine, I wasn't there that day, I told them to go get the refrigerators and the washer and dryer, and they just took the stove. Well, that was a mistake. Yes, and I have it, and I've told him he can go get it. He doesn't have to time. go get it. Why should he have to go through the expense of going to get it? It's right there in town, where, like, just a couple blocks from where I live. Well, he has a big go, truck, I don't, and you... he and I was friends this whole time. And until May, when I got married, Daniel and I was friends. All these agreements was made with us being friends. That's why I don't have documentation of this and that and this and that. Well... 
What happened, Miss Adams, is that you got married in May and planned to move and his daughter to another state. My husband's in the military. I don't care whether he is in the military or he's in the circus. You can't take his child away. Judge Judy continues in a moment. You don't want to discuss with me why you who have three children don't have any of them living with you, do you? And it's not because he took your house away. And later today... Alcohol basically has ruined... ...wife Dorothy Adams owes for loans and for taking his property from their shared home. Dorothy says Daniel is angry over her new marriage. When did you tell him that you were planning to move to Georgia? Uh... When did she tell you? About May 2nd. And when was the move going to take place? I had no idea. I was very, it was very discreet. When was the move to take place? Well, my husband's no, still just in... No, just give me a date. It'll be after January of this year before I could even possibly move. He's still in AIT. When were you planning to move? That's what I gave him, an indefinite, like way back, like several months from then. Is that right? Mm hmm what did she tell you? I, did, I had no idea. She was in a, a separate relationship, and they broke up Look April April 24th. Yeah. At May 15th, she was married to another guy that I had never met, my daughter had never met, and she said that she was going to be moving out of state. Your Honor, the reason why Daniel didn't know of my new marriage and of my expectations and what I was planning on getting from that is because of these. These are his legal records showing that Daniel was not... Mr. Sweet Kind here, let me help you out here. He's got assault and battery. He's got shoot and throw missiles at an occupied vehicle. I don't care, madam. Listen to me. It has nothing to do with this. You don't want to discuss with me why you who have three children don't have any of them living with you, do you? No, but this and is it's why not, I wanted and to it's, get out listen of state. To me. Listen to me. And it's not because he took your house away. I mean, if you have three children, somebody takes your house away, you don't let your children go someplace else with your mother, with their other father, you go to a shelter someplace, you get a job and you get an apartment. So we don't have to go into history. The only issue that I have before me is whether you owe him this money and whether you took the refrigerator and the stoves that he purchased. And why, after what apparently was a reasonable period between the two of you having been divorced, he had a house, you were in the house with your three children, you needed money, you called him, he loaned you money. Problem was, when you married somebody that he didn't know, and you told him you're taking your kids and you're moving hundreds of miles away. And he said, what, are you crazy? You're not going to take my daughter. You may take your other two children. Their fathers may not care, but you're not taking my daughter away. And then you got angry, and you left the house like a trash bin, and you took property that didn't belong to you. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $5,000. That's all. Parties are excused. You may step out. Until I come up with something, you know, concrete against him. All parties in the matter of Torres versus Briley. Step forward. You purchased cell phones, and he was supposed to pay his bill. He didn't pay his bill. You also want him to pay for his cell phone. Yes. The defendant says that the money that you did, in fact, give him to have his car fixed was just that a gift, that he provided all the support for you and his child while you were living in an apartment together, that the phone was something that he purchased, and he paid for that, and he paid for the one month's worth of service that he actually used the phone, and then you shut the phone off. He has a counterclaim because he says that in April, at the time that the two of you separated, you had him falsely arrested for domestic violence, and he believes he should be compensated for the 27-hour police precinct. Is that correct, sir? Correct. Okay. On what date, Mr. Mealy, were you arrested for domestic violence? April 3rd, 2006. And at that time, how long had you and Miss Arnold been living together? We'd been together for living together for a little over a year. Now, Miss Arnold, in the year that you were living together, you were living in an apartment. Is that right? Correct. We lived in the apartment just from December to April. And when was your child born? January 24th, 2006. Keep your voice up, please. Okay. So from the time you moved into the apartment, I assume, until the time that you separated in April, you were not working. I had one job for about two weeks. So you were not working? No. And Mr. Mealy was supporting the household? Yes. He was paying the rent? Yes. He was paying for food? Yes. He was paying the gas, electric, and utilities? Yes. Paid for the expenses of the baby at home? Mostly. Well, you didn't. So if... No, but state helped. How much did the state help? I believe I got... Well, right. As soon as I moved out, I got 440 and he has paid a dollar towards child support in the last three months. I'm not asking you that. Okay. I'm asking you from December until April. Pretty much all of it. So he paid for everything? Yes. And you put the car repairs on your credit card? Part of them, yes. 
Six hundred dollars worth. I put two ten down on my credit card, and I'm making payments for the rest. How much in total? Um, I believe the total was five hundred and fifty-eight. Five hundred and fifty-eight dollars. So for the four months that you lived together, your capital contribution was five hundred and fifty-eight dollars. Yes. That seemed reasonable to you? No, but I did have the baby. So what? So did millions of other people, madam. I just think it's kind of hard to work being nine months pregnant. And... You working now? No. Where are you living? I just got a triplex with my boyfriend. With your boyfriend? Yes. Well, you didn't just have a baby and you're not nine months pregnant, so how come you're not working? I'm looking for a job. Well, you've been looking for a long time. Your baby was born January. So first your baby was born, then you had state aid, now you found another boyfriend to support you. Let's hear what happened in April on the 3rd, sir. April of the 3rd, uh, I picked Destiny up from Albertsons at the job she said she did have for two weeks on her lunch break. I lived one block uh, from the Albertsons that she worked at. When you say you lived there, is that where you lived together? No, she'd actually moved out. Okay, so she moved out and you were picking her up from work anyway? Yeah, she asked me to come and pick her up for lunch. Okay. And I did so. I went down and I picked Destiny up uh, for lunch. I brought her to my apartment. Where was the baby? Uh, with her mother. Okay, so you brought it to your apartment. Is that where she wanted to go? Yes. For what? For lunch. Okay. And at that time, uh, me and Destiny started arguing. What were you arguing about? Uh, we had a car that we purchased together, and Destiny's sister's ex-fiance was the dealer of that car, and he had not sent the stuff into the state, and Destiny went back to him and asked him to change it because she was going to leave me. And you mean to change the title? Change the title. And he to her name? He rewrote the whole title to her name. When was the car purchased? In November of 2005. In November of 2005, where did the money come to purchase the car? Destiny had a car previous to that. It was a Pontiac Grand Am. We sold that car and used that money to put the down payment for that car. I supported that car and I paid for all the repairs, fixings. And from November until April? No, from when Destiny first moved out. Which was when? In August 2005. So from August 2005 until April? Yes. You made the payments on the car? I made the insurance payments as well as the car repairs for both the Jeep and the Grand Am. Who made the car payment? Me had moved out and she used the state's aid for the car payment. So you were both paying something for the car? Correct. Now I understand what the argument was about. You were annoyed that for whatever you put into the car, you were getting nothing. Yes. And okay, fine. So that's what the argument was about. Now what happened during the course of that argument because it escalated and the police were ultimately yeah. called. Uh, Destiny also was selling my stuff on eBay. I what was stuff? Video game consoles. I had a very large collection of almost every game console and... I don't know what that is. The PlayStations, the Sega Saturn, and Destiny was selling on eBay. I then asked for Destiny's keys back. She said no. You mean she was taking your property out of your house? Yes. Were you selling his property on eBay? We both... The answer is either yes or no. Technically, no. We both owned the game consoles. I had talked to him about this. We sold them on eBay, and we split the sharing. You I split made... the what? We split the money that we received from it. He made a, c a credit card payment, and I made a payment to Les Schwab from the tires that I bought for him. I'm not talking about tires. I'm asking you whether you were selling his property on eBay. I know. Technically, it was both of our property, and we split the money that we got from eBay. So then there were arguments. So you asked for her keys back because you said she was taking stuff from your house. Correct. And she wasn't living there anymore. Correct. Good. Okay. And what happened when you asked for the keys back? She denied me the keys and said what that... What did she say? She had more stuff inside the house. She wanted to move out. Uh, her keys were then sitting on top of her purse. I pulled them out and that's when Destiny grabbed for the keys back and I refused to... Uh, give them back. Give them back. Go ahead. Destiny did scratch my arm. I had scratches on my arm, and that is in the police report. However, the police report uh, would not be released to me. Just listen to me. After you grabbed the keys, by the way, whose name is on the lease? Mine. And she had moved out when? She moved out in July. She moved out in July? She was still coming around in April? Yes. Is that right? No. When I did you move out? I moved out of the apartment in April. When did you stop sleeping in there? In April. Is that right? Yes. I thought you said she moved out in July. It was the end of July, beginning of April. June. Mr. Mealy, you want to go over the months again? 
I have my months confused. <laughs> so you had not been sleeping in the apartment. You already broke up. Yes. Is that right? And you moved out and you moved in with your mother. Yes. Okay. Judge Judy continues in a moment. You told the police that he probably scratched himself to get you in trouble. I wasn't sure. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Destiny Arnold claims the father of her child, Nicholas Mealy, owes for car repair costs and a cell phone bill. Nicholas is countersuing, claiming Destiny had him falsely arrested for domestic violence. Now, when you have this argument over the keys, you say that she scratched you. Yes. Did you touch her? I pushed her hands away off of scratching me, yes. Who called the police? I did. We both did. Who called the police first? I did. And where was she when you called the police? She was outside, uh, standing by her car. How did you get outside? When he ripped my purse from my hands to get my keys, I told him I was going to call the police. I ran to the next door neighbor and nobody was home. When I ran back into his apartment to grab my purse off the counter where he had put it, he was on the phone with the police telling them that I was hitting him and pushing him. So, so I grabbed my purse and my phone and I walked outside to the parking lot and I called the police. So he called the police first? Yes. Did you have any witnesses on you? No, ma'am. You have a police report? Yes, I do. I'd like to see it. What happened, Miss Arnold, when you went to the neighbor's house? Nobody was home. What did you go to the neighbor's house for? To call the police. He had taken my phone and my purse from me. What were you calling the police about? Um, he had ripped my purse from me. And... So you were calling the police because you took your purse? Yes. Miss Arnold, you weren't honest with the police. Yes, I was. No, you weren't. According to the police officer, you said that he assaulted you. That's not true. Um, he ripped... That's not true. Okay. He did not assault you. He did not assault you took your purse because he wanted the keys. Not a smart thing to do, but he did not assault you. And the police officer noted scratch marks on him, nothing on you. Correct. I have no idea why he was arrested. And you told the police that he probably scratched himself to get you in trouble. I wasn't sure what had happened. I did not recall touching him at all. Well, that's going to be an expensive fib and an expensive scratch, Miss Arnold. I really don't remember touching him. That's too bad. I believe him. Okay. And I believe that it's an unfortunate breakup. She used her influence with the dealership to change the title to a car, which she knew you had an interest in. According to the police, she acknowledged to the police that she destroyed the sales agreement, which listed you as a co-owner of the car and had the papers changed because that was what the dispute was about. You know, if things don't work out, Miss Arnold, they don't work out. But you're supposed to be fair and reasonable. I don't think you were fair and reasonable at all. So that's going to cost you. So I don't even have to deal with your claim. You're not supposed to make false reports about people. There's no question in my mind that if he had assaulted you and you went to a neighbor's house because you wanted your pocketbook back, if he had assaulted you, you would not have gone back into the apartment. You would have gone yet to another neighbor. But certainly, if one is in fear of their life or their physical situation, they don't go back to the same environment. They leave. You chose not to do that. You chose to go back, which suggests to me you weren't in fear. You knew he wasn't going to hit you. You knew he wasn't going to put his hands on you. Yeah. And the only reason, put your hand down, and the only reason you called the police is because when you came into the apartment, he was on the phone with the police. He is an abusive man. He has taped the binky into our daughter's mouth. My mom had seen him push Listen him. to me. Stop making up stories. Sounds to me as if however old you are. How old are you, 20? 18. 18. Well, you already have a baby with one man. You moved in with your mother. Now you moved into another apartment with yet a new boyfriend. Sounds to me your life is going in a downward spiral. I suggest you fix it. Okay. Judgment on the counterclaim for the amount of $2,000. Your claim is subsumed by the counterclaim, okay. which means it's taken care of by the counterclaim. That's all. Thank you. Why is excuse excused? May step out. He will not see her. He will not have any contact with her. They can say what they want and lie about what they want. I will be going to get full custody. Uh, those are just comments. And I know he will never see his child again. I plan. All parties in the matter of Oreg versus Galvin. Step forward, please. Step up. Call center supervisor Penny Davis is suing the father of her son, car rental manager Jerome Jimison, for a loan to buy a motorcycle. Jerome says... Penny was supposed to use her child's support money to make payments. 
Ms. Davis, the defendant is your former boyfriend and the father of your children. How many children do you have with him? We only have one. When was the last time you lived together? Over five years. When did you make this loan for a motorcycle? July of 2003. Why? Uh, basically, he wanted to purchase a motorcycle, uh, so he came to me and asked me if I would help him obtain a loan to purchase a motorcycle. Why couldn't he get his own loan? His credit wasn't good enough for that. So uh, he did all the legwork, and basically I showed up and signed the papers, and he got a check for the uh, purchase of the motorcycle. Wasn't that a big mistake? Um, I would have to second-guess myself at this point and say yes, but at that point in time, I thought I was helping someone that I could trust. So you thought you were helping out a friend, but then... He stopped making payments on the loan. Yes. When did you stop making payments on the loan, sir? Actually, my last payment was November of last year. Why? Um, when I lost my job, about three months after we got the loan, um, I got another job making considerably less, and child support was not lowered. So? Uh, Penny and I actually had a conversation then in the summer of last year uh, where she agreed that because I could not get that child support modified and lowered to then match the new calculation on my new salary, that she would then pay that amount. No, I did not. Just a second. She would pay what amount? Uh, any additional amount towards the loan because I could no longer afford it. Afford it. Why didn't you sell the motorcycle? There's no way I would get anything close to what I paid you for it. You have the title to it? Yeah. Let me see it. And I'll actually say on it that it is a rebuilt uh, salvage. So this motorcycle is how old? 1994 with some 95 parts on it, I think. Now, you don't use this to get back and forth to work, is that right? No. It's a hobby? Oh, to some degree. And how much do you think you could get for it if you went to sell it? A grand to 1200 And how much is left on the loan? 3744 and 3744 And 61 cents. That's okay, the payoff so that's the amount. Payoff. Yes. That's, that's the payoff amount. Yes. I also asked Mr. Jemison to give me the title. Yeah, well, he's going to do that today. Judge Judy, if I can mention one thing. When we entered into this agreement... Just a second. Okay. Before he mentions a thing, Bird, find the right place where he's supposed to sign off on this thing because he's going to give the title mm -hmm. to us so she can sell it. Can I make a statement short of that? Not short of it. After you sign it. Transfer Roar. Perfect. Now you can give that to her. Now you can go pick it up. Thank you. And sell it. Now you want to say something to me, Mr. Jimison? Yeah. We went in it with the understanding that she'd have my back and I'd have hers. I had no problem paying for the loan, following or assuming that she would do what she could to help me out. What, what you wanted her to do, sir, is to lower your child support payments. Right. So that you could pay for this hobby craft. That's what sure. you want. Listen to me. Listen to me, sir. Mm -hmm. If you said to me, Judge, I needed a way to get to work. And if I couldn't get to work, I couldn't pay child support. This is my mode of transportation. I'd have a little sympathy for you. That's not what you're saying to me. You're saying to me, this is a hobby. Mm -hmm. I have another car that I use for work. I don't actually I'm, own a car. I don't care how you get to work. I don't care if you get to work by subway or if you get to work by okay. trolley. Okay. This is not your mode of transportation to work. So if you lost your job and you had to replace a job with a job where you were making less money, the answer isn't cutting your child support payment, sir. The answer is oh, getting rid of your... I'm speaking. The answer is getting rid of your hobby. You don't say to her, take less money, agree to take less money so that I can make the payments, because that's what you said in your answer. I said to myself, I'm not getting this right. Well, let, let me try He to... wants to reduce his child support, and she said no. So let me read it here. Let me read it here so I got it. It's, I should have it exactly. She agreed to make the payments out of the child support that I was giving her. Out of the additional child support. There's no additional child support, sir. There's no additional child support. You Can moved I... for a downward modification. Because yes. Because you, you moved for a downward modification. Right. The downward modification was denied. Correct. So there's no extra child support. She didn't get extra child support. You didn't like the computation with your new job. And your new job, according to the federal guidelines, probably said there's a low end and a high end. And right. they said to you, you whatever it is, you're going to pay the high end. Right. Been there, okay. done that. Now you have a judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $2,544. Sell the motorcycle. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you. Parties are excused. You may step out. It's a shame it had to end this way. And it's unfortunate that now that my child's 
support for my son is going to get lower. He's had three additional children since I got my child support order, so now he's paying child support on, on four children instead of just ours. I don't know if she's still got a, the hots for me or what, and she's jealous that now i got a motorcycle or what. Basically, uh, we'll have an amicable relationship as far as our son is concerned, but as far as any friendship, uh, that was there prior to then. That's gone. friends. Yes, right. used to. How, well, you say that they didn't treat him nicely, and they used him for rides and stuff when they needed him. Right, Your Honor. But at some point, according to you, this young man posted some very, very rude things about you. Right, Your Honor. On something called MySpace. Right, Your Honor. MySpace is one of these internet sites where people who have nothing better to do with their time go and chat about a whole bunch of nonsense. Right. Your is that about what it yes, is? Your is that about right? Right. That's about right. You know, I always said that we could eliminate probably a third of the problems in this country if people actually had to shovel coal in a furnace for heat <laughs> rather than spending yeah. all that spare time that they have making problems for other people and sitting behind their computers doing things other than for which computers were originally designed. Mr. Luna says, First Amendment. I can post anything I like on the Internet because there's free speech in this country. That is your defense. Yes, Your Honor. Really? Yes. Is that what you think well, the Constitution says, Mr. Luna? Well, first of all... I didn't ask you first of all. That required a yes or a no answer, sir. Is that what you think the Constitution says? That yes. you can yes, say Honor. anything you want to about anybody? On an, uh, certain grounds, yes. But I believe that I didn't write anything that really damaged her reputation as she claimed. All right. Well, then let's see what you said, because I had no clue about what you said here. First, Mr. Luna, since there is no issue, sir, that you posted these things about Mrs. Mendelssohn on this Internet site, I'd like to know why you did it. Okay. Well, it all started um, when me, myself, Oh, me, me, myself, is one, the same person, yes, I, I assume, <laughs> unless you're me, bipolar. Me and my friends were talking just online, just joking while we were waiting for our classes. And then we just talked about certain stupid things, I know. And then... You talked about stupid things while you were waiting for change of classes in college? Yes. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, we were online. Who's paying for your school? My father. Your father is paying for you to yes. be in school and talk about stupid things with you. Is well, that what you think you're paying for, sir? Not really. Good. Perfect. Love to hear it. You and I are going to get along just fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, we were just waiting for our classes because uh, me I, I don't had... care why you were waiting for your classes. I asked you why you said bad things about Mrs. Mendelssohn. Well, it was just to relieve our... Our stress and frustrations. Why don't you from get a her. job? Well, I had school. I have. I'm a full-time college student. Well, then why are you writing about Mrs. Mendelssohn to relieve your stress? <laughs> because for, um, beforehand, she was making comments about us, me and my friends, specifically. Oh, on the internet? No, like um, to her son. So she was having a private conversation with her son about you and your friends. Yes, and then she's allowed to do that. Yes, but it, it was very rude and very untrue. And she assumed many things, and she would tell Who him. Who cares? Who cares what she assumed? She's having a private conversation with a child. She's not publishing anything. Let me see what you wrote about her. I have it right here. Did your father okay. see it? Yes. When did you show it to him? About a month ago. When did you write it? October 26th. So why did you wait so long to show your father? Well, because, um, number one, I was trying to handle my own business. And then the month after October 26th, I actually forgot about the conversation because that is a conversation between me and Shh. Derek. You know what I find most distressing about this, Mr. Luna? Um, is that you're illiterate and so is your friend. And that your family is wasting a whole lot of money sending you to college and getting an illiterate person at the end. Mr. Luna? Can I say something, Mr. Your Luna, Honor? did you read this? Yes, Your Honor. I read it lately, Your Honor. Stand up, sir. May I say something about the case, Your Honor? No, you may say nothing about the case, sir. You may answer my questions. First of all, Mrs. Mendelssohn, I have just read this. Yes. Okay? This is not actionable, mm -hmm. which means that you can sue, but you're not going to win. What is written here, if I can read it, yes, because it's, uh, it looks like it's written by somebody who was educated in some third world country where they only go up to kindergarten. <laughs> Watch what W-A-T, you, you, say about her, cuz, C-U-Z, she might come to your house, Y-R, and do crazy, and I'll, that's a bad word, I'll leave that out, 
like castrating you and sewing your, you are, I'll use a different word, testicles back on backwards and sewing your foot and you with it. Okay? It's stupid. Do you know what, that's what you're complaining about, right? Yes, Listen to me. Listen to me. I didn't know what he had said about you. What he said about you was stupid. Nobody takes it seriously. Nobody's thinking you're going to come to somebody's house and you're going to do that to them. He's just being stupid. So it doesn't even amount to free speech. It amounts to the rantings of some juvenile who's just being dumb. Do you understand? Yeah. And I was really upset because... Well, uh, I can understand I'm, you were upset, but that's I'm not, not actionable. Person. Now, was this young man your friend, Mr. Luna? Yes, we were very close. You say some bad things about him. Well, it was... Well, it's not an answer, sir. You say if you were very, very close, why do you say bad things about him in here? It's a uh, friendly banter between us. That's what we do. Who was bantering here? Not him. Well, it's between no, me no, no, and... No, no, no. Between you... And him. Yes. Not you and him. You weren't bantering with each other, calling each other funky names. You were bantering with him. And you were making fun of him. Mr. Luna, that makes you not a very nice person when you say he was a friend of mine. Yes, but you know, all of us are friends. We, we do the same things to each other. But does he have it, it a does... car? Yes. Do you have a car? No. Who drove you around? Well, sometimes Irving drives me around. Sometimes my friend recently. But it's not like I'm... It's not like you're using him or anything. Yeah, no, no, not at all. <laughs> Judge Judy continues in a moment. Irving, stand up next to your mother. Did you ever tell this young man that your mother accused him of abusing drugs? Not exactly. And later today... You had a court date you don't remember? What kind of court date did you have? It was actually court for his paternity test. Yes. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Anita Mandelson claims her son's former friend, Christian Luna, slandered her on the internet. Christian says he has the right to free speech. Mr. Luna, your son did a disrespectful thing, but not actionable. So you don't have to worry. He doesn't have to pay Mrs. Mendelssohn any money. I don't know if he's a nice young man or not a nice young man. Only you know that. Can I say something, Your Honor? Yes. He's a nice young man. In fact, he helped Irving in his religion class, and he's kind of mentoring this guy. I mean, they were friends, uh, Your Honor, and uh, it Did all you read started... This? Yeah, I know, I, I, I read it. But it all started when Mrs. Mendelssohn tried to blame my son and his friends that they are using drugs. Yes. And she's trying to, you know, separate his son from these guys who are nice people. I just don't know why Mrs. Mendelssohn is so mad at my son. Maybe you want to tell me, Mrs. Mendelssohn? Uh, the truth, Your Honor, is that I never said that they're using drugs. It was a lie. What I told my son is that because I saw a lot of this abuse from Christian sending all those messages against him, and I told my son, stop giving him a ride and try transfer to other school and I didn't mention anything about drugs you're wrong well, who told you that mrs. Mendelssohn accused you of using drugs um her son he told you yes Irving stand up next to your mother did you ever tell this young man that your mother accused him of using drugs not in, in exactly what do you mean not exactly Irving well, she said that she doesn't want me hanging around people who do who do drugs okay so and in that sense that's what I s said to Christian but she never accused Christian of doing drugs no, no. that's your answer mr. Luna what else um, I would just like to clear something out I didn't use Irving don't just randomly call him and like oh can you give me a ride to to this so-and-so place I would ask him a ride if we were going there together but I have, I've never used them just Christian, to... I want you to listen to me very carefully. Okay. Having access to a machine like a computer and access to a place like MySpace where you can say very damaging and hurtful things doesn't mean that you should use it. When you write something like this, even though it sounds asinine, juvenile, and stupid, it was still hurtful to Mrs. Mendelssohn. It's not the kind of thing that the courts will take action about, mm -hmm. but it's the kind of things that you shouldn't write about one person because it's just unkind. And you can't hide behind the cloak of anonymity when you do that because it's out there for millions and millions and millions of people to read. And it's hurtful. And I say this to you and to your friends and to you and anybody else who uses the Internet. Once you put something down and go send or whatever you do, because I don't use that machine, it's out there, and it's out there forever, and it's hurtful. You have to be careful. Now, what your son said about her was unkind. I know that your honor... Very good. Then you're telling me did the wrong thing? 
Tell him to apologize to her. In fucking Say, shh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mendelssohn. Okay. That's it. Just don't do it again, ever. Please. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Why does I excuse? You may step out. Well, I agree with Judge Judy that I, what I wrote is obscene. I just hope he will stop the abuse towards my son now. And I agree that it was offensive. All parties in the matter of Ernest versus Kennedy, step forward, please. And he assaulted you because he believed that you were messing around with his wife. You want your bills paid, your medical bills, your dental bills. Mr. Podani said he was sort of defending himself because you went after him first. Donna, let's see. Hmm. You weren't arrested for this assault, sir? No, I wasn't. Lucky. Okay, Mr. McDonald, how do you and the defendant's wife know each other? I've worked with her for six years. She also is a friend. Tell me when this assault took place. The assault took place September 16, 2006. It took place at my place of work. Me and Joan went to get something to eat. We returned. What time? At 5.30. After the place a closed? After work, yes. What kind of work do you do? I do hair for a living. So after work, the place closed down and you and the defendant's wife went out for dinner. Is this the first time you, you did that? No, I have uh, worked with Joan for six years. So you've gone out for dinner before? She's been a manager uh, at a business I owned before. So I've, I, yes, we've gone out to eat before. Nothing else, just dinner? Just dinner. Ever anything else other than just dinner? No, just dinner. Went out for dinner, that was about 5.30. What time did you get back? 6.30. And you, I assume, came back, you went in one car? Yes, went so in my you, truck. You were coming back to pick up her car? Correct. That's the scene. Tell me what happened. Uh, we pulled up in the parking lot where I work. Uh, as I pulled up, I saw that Mike was in the parking lot also. Had you met him before? I've known Mike for, for most of that six years also, to the point of actually playing cards and stuff together. Um, pulled up, I saw Mike starting to walk towards my truck. When he got up next to my truck, I rolled down my window. Mike punched me through my truck window. I then ended up trying to get out of the vehicle. I was unable to get out of the vehicle because he kept shutting the vehicle. So I went over the passenger seat, got out of the vehicle, asked him what was up. His response was that I was messing around with his wife. We told him that we had gone out to eat. I actually had the food container from, from going out to eat in my vehicle. I gave that to him. Shortly after, the police responded to the scene, asked what... Who called the police? I think a witness in the parking lot called the police. They, they responded fairly fast. Um, they separated all three parties. Everybody shouting at everybody else? No, it, it wasn't that. They just separated. There was actually three squads that showed up on the scene. They separated Joan, Mike, Where and was Joan? Joan was with me during this time. She was in the passenger seat, so she also had to go out. She was there when the police showed up. The police asked me if I had been assaulted. I said I had. They asked me what I wanted to do about it, if they wanted to charge Mike. I had said no, but I did tell them. At the time, I thought I was going to lose a tooth that was already a fake tooth, so I knew it was going to cost me money. Um, so I told them if I lose my tooth, I'd like to have him pay for it. And I also asked the police to let him know not to come around me anymore from that point on. Hindsight, I wish I would have pressed charges at that time. At the time that that happened, I did not because I knew that that would potentially cause some trouble for their home. Plus, I know that Mike had some potential trouble in the past, and I did not know if that was going to create a bigger problem than what they already had. But since that time, the stitches came out to be the amount that I'm suing for, the 21, 29. How many stitches did you I ended up with uh, eight stitches in the front and two in my mouth. Where? Uh, right there. I have a scar from it. Well, it all started back when uh, I asked my wife if they've been messing around, and she said, no, they haven't. And then she tells me that she's not in love with me anymore. Um, she told me that night that she's working until 6.30. So we were supposed to go out. We had an engagement to go out on a buddy's yacht to go boating. I called her up. She didn't answer the phone. I called her cell phone. She didn't answer that either. I thought maybe she was just cleaning up, so I thought I'd swing out there and help her clean up. What time was she due home, sir? 6.30. So you swung out to see if you could help her clean up? Right. And the place is all locked up, closed up, and her car is sitting out in the parking lot. What time did you get there? Uh, it must have been about quarter to six. So you waited? So I waited, and I called her on the phone. Of course, she didn't answer. Next thing I know, they pull up together in his truck. I walked up to angry at what's been going on because I've been accusing her. Uh, actually, these two of screwing around for a while now. And uh, I walked up to his, his truck, and I thought he was going to, since I was mad and angry, I thought he was going to kick the door at me, so I grabbed it, and when he rolled down the window, I punched him. So I'm, you know, defending 
my family trying to protect it. And no, you're not. I think no. I was. And well, now they're together. Well, but you're not, sir. You're not allowed to do that. Even if they were doing more than just having dinner after work. You're not allowed to put your well, hands on somebody else. I know I'm not supposed else. to hit them. And so I why did you wrong, do it? But, How many other people you know, have you hit when you got angry? None. You've been in trouble with the law before? Yes. For what? Fraud. Nothing other than fraud? No. Is it a long time ago or recently? A long time ago. Okay, what kind of work do you do, Mr. Padana? I do home inspections. You have children? Yes, I have four. How long are you married? Ten years. How old are your children? I have a nine-year-old with Joan, and I have two 20-year-olds and a 17-year-old. With your former wife? Right. How long are you divorced from your former wife? Fifteen years. Was it your idea or her idea? Both. So you fell out of love with each other? Right. You fell out of love with each other? Right. And then I raised those three kids. Good. I mean, that's nice. But you fell out of love with each other because right. that happens. You understood that that happens. Right. You didn't beat her up, did you, because she fell out of love with no. you? No. She didn't beat you up because you fell out of love with her? No. Right? Never hit a woman. But it happens. It happens. It happens. It, it does. It happens. It happens. She doesn't say that you have the right to hit no, him. I'm not proud of hitting him, but... Fine, so then you have to take care of his bills. How much were your bills? The medical bills were 21, 29. I had to have the truck cleaned out. That was 175. The clothes I was wearing was 125, and I missed a day's work following the incident, which was 500. I was told he didn't miss any work. Whether he missed any work or not, sir, he's not even suing you for pain and suffering, which he should. Absolutely should. You have no right to put your hands on somebody else. He's suing you for 29.29, which is nothing. If he would have sued you for $5,000, I would have given it to him. What? <laughs> um, since then, I've had to get a restraining order against him because he's actually contacted my ex-wife to find out where I live. Judge Judy continues in a moment. You moved on once? You survived? Move on again. How old are you? 41. 41. You're a baby. I got a son 42 years old who's never been married once. You're looking for <laughs> wife number three. Tell me your secret. And later today... Do you have a gambling problem? No. Do you have a drug problem? No. Your aunt says it was about $150,000 that you blew. People. Judge Judy. Music producer Clifton Torres is suing the mother of his children, Brandy Briley, for destroying his music equipment. Brandy claims the equipment was broken prior to the incident in question. Mr. Torres, you and Miss Briley had a relationship, according to what I read, and I assume that you lived together for a period of time. It is your claim that a year ago she ruined some of your musical equipment. You want her to pay so that you can purchase new equipment. That's correct. Miss Briley said that while the equipment that you are complaining about was in fact tossed over, during this altercation. The altercation occurred because you pushed her and the equipment wasn't working so well to begin with. I have, you have children? Yes, two. Are they your children together? Yes. How old are they? Uh, two and five. Who do they live with? They live with me. And how long have they lived with you? Um, alone? Alone. Without the defendant? Uh, I guess approximately a year, maybe a little less. Did they live with you, Mr. Torres, pursuant to a court order? Yes. Was there a contested custody proceeding? No. Ms. Briley agreed for you to care for the children? Correct. Now tell me the date of this incident with your music equipment, please. Um, it was November 21st, and um, I came home from work. It was 5.30. What kind of work were you doing? Um, at the time, I was working at a construction warehouse. Could you keep your voice up, Mr. Torres? I was working at a construction warehouse, and I uh, came home at like about 5.30, and um, we had gotten into an argument. About what? Just about living arrangements, uh, personal, personal stuff, you know. Um, we just had a lot of, you know, disagreements about things. Okay. Um, and uh, the verbal argument turned kind of physical, pushing and shoving and whatnot. And um, as I left to leave, that's when the uh, the equipment was damaged. As I let, turned, because I was just trying to leave. As I turned to leave, um, I heard a smash on the floor. I turned around and that my uh, my equipment was on the floor, destroyed. But it did not fall as a result of the altercation. No, it happened after the altercation. It happened when Directly you were exiting. Directly after. As I'm trying to leave, that's when it happened. All right, Ms. Barley, tell me about it. Um, basically, he came home, he got in a disagreement. Um, you remember what the disagreement was about? Our living arrangements and personal problems. What, what does that mean? It, we were just disagreeing on lots of different things. Like, uh, for the most part, it was our living arrangements. But as he pushes me back because he doesn't want to listen to what I have to say. Well, um, he's coming home from work. You're home all day. 
Is yes. that right? Yes. You're home all day with two children. Yes. Two very small children. Yes. Right? Did you ever have any drug or alcohol problem? No. Never. No. You hesitated for a moment. Well, I have drank before, but I've never had a problem with it. Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, he pushes me back. I go to get my balance on the stand where the NPC equipment was, and it goes to slide off. And I did help it go to the ground. Like, I didn't try and catch it or anything, but my main argument is it was already broken before so, any of that ever happened. Tell me about it already being broken before. Well, as you know, I stay at home every day, so I did all the cleaning, and it had been in the box for a period of time. And I know he said he wasn't using it for a while, so... I would assume it wasn't working. Well, you can't make any assumptions, so you don't know that it wasn't working. From what I understood from him, it wasn't. Did you ever tell her the equipment wasn't working? No, I have a picture of the equipment. It actually, um, it was actually in the box. I have a picture of the box. Can I see it, please? Um, it's basically a um, piece of equipment that's used in the preliminary stages of music production. It basically makes the outlining beat, and from there it goes into a computer. So what she's telling me, sir, is that she actually did break the equipment, because that's what she said in so many words. She said, well, it started to fall, and I sort of helped it. <laughs> well, what it, kind of work do you do, Miss Briley? I work with the developmentally disabled at a day treatment program. How much money do you earn? Is that relevant? Yes. Anything I ask is relevant. Um... How would you like it then? Weekly? Weekly, bi weekly, bi however you're paid. I make about $2,000 a month after taxes. How much do you pay in child support? Um, currently, I don't pay child support. I assist with getting their needs. Like, I went school shopping for my son. I help buy diapers. Like Mr. Torres? Yes. You are the full time custodial parent of these children? That's correct. You're supposed to collect child support for them. Do you understand that, sir? Your Honor, we made the uh, agreement for. Um uh, custody or whatnot, there was a um, verbal um, agreement basically that she was going to help out in certain things and uh, I wasn't supposed to uh, receive child support for six months. So Six months is now passed, sir. Right. It was, so? a, it was a couple months before we got into court, before we made that agreement, almost six months since then. So it hasn't been exactly six months. Well, yet. what I'm telling you, Mr. Torres, is it is not your right to have a support order fixed for your children. Right. It is the children's right to have a child support order fixed for them. Support order. I'm in the process. I go back on the uh, 28th. We go back to court. So fine. Process of doing that. Do you have a bill for this equipment, sir? Uh, yes, I do. May I see it, please? I actually have a. I have, I'll just give this all to you. I have a police report, and I have. Um, I don't have the receipt because it was purchased in about 2001. I do have a um, an ad for the same exact equipment. It's pretty much almost exactly identical. Let me see it. You'll be able to, to see that for yourself. I brought it to uh, to get looked at at a shop and uh, they basically um, rendered it you know, irreparable because the, uh, the motherboard, the internal CPU board is cracked due to the fall. Did you get a protective order, Mr. Torres? I had one at one time, but it was uh, disengaged. Was it as a result of this? Um, no, it was something that happened prior to, uh, before that. How much did you pay for the equipment, sir? Um, $2,400. Well, you can replace it for $1,700, correct? Um, that's correct. That's not exactly the identical model because it may it's, not uh, be, it's but it's also model, five probably. years ago. I, I understand. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of seventeen hundred dollars. That's all. Step out. What is our excuse? You must step out. I think she did the best job she could. I think it was a fair decision. Well, I think we'll be pretty civil. I'm gonna be able to, you know, purchase my equipment that gets me back. Eighteen-year-old Justin Orrick is suing his former friend, nineteen-year-old Drew Galvin, for knocking over his ninja motorcycle. Drew says the bike was parked in the wrong spot. Mr. Rourke, you were at a party and the defendant was also at a party and it is your claim that he damaged your motorcycle, which you had driven to the party. Mr. Galvin says that the motorcycle was in fact damaged, but it was your fault because you parked it in the wrong place. Is that right, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Tell me what happened, Mr. Rourke. Uh, I got off work about uh, 9 o'clock. I called my friends and... Uh... They all said they were over at some girl's house, so uh, I got directions over there, and uh, I pulled up over there. On your motorcycle? Yes, ma'am. What kind of motorcycle is it? It's a 1997 ZX-7R Ninja 750. <sighs> Sounds very impressive. How much did you pay for it, sir? Uh, about 3500 When did you purchase it? Um, in August of 05. Okay. Uh, I parked it, and uh, he was sitting on the back of his car. And uh, he was pretty intoxicated, and he, he let me know that. And uh, How did know, he let you know that? Well, uh, you know, I shook his hand. You know, he's like, how's it going? He's, he's like, I'm, I can smell it. And he's like, I'm pretty drunk, you know. 
And uh, I was just like, all right, yeah, whatever, that's fine. And uh, I walk into the house because that's where pretty much everyone was. And I was sitting in there talking, and um, everybody heard this crash. I got up and door. I noticed my motorcycle laying on the ground. He was over there trying to pick it up. Helmet was rolling around in a big puddle of water and uh, trying to figure out what was going on. He said he was sitting on it, and it fell over on one side. And that he went to pick it up, and it fell over the kickstand onto the other side. And that's the crash that we heard. And um, I just told him I wanted the money and everything. You know, he was intoxicated, so he got all mad and started trying to fight. He's like, I'll fight you over it right now. What were you going to fight him over, sir? I never said that, but that's beside the point. Mm. Why were you so drunk? Uh, actually, uh, to... How old are you? I'm 19 years old. That's okay. what's so silly about You're this whole thing. Just a second. Okay. Who do you think is going to be in control of this courtroom, Mr. Galvin, you or me? You. Right, so first stand up and take your hands off the table. Very good. You're 19. You can stand on your own two feet. That would be perfect. So why would a 19-year-old boy get so drunk? Is there nothing else to do in Arkansas? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, pretty much. There's nothing there. There's cows and, like, people with nothing to do. So they drink? The majority of them, yes. You drink? Um, on occasions, yes. Well, but you were drinking on May 6th. Yeah, I had a little. Did you go to school? Do you work? What do you do to uh, occupy yes, yourself? Yes, ma'am. I what? work. You work for whom? Uh, Razorback Car Wash and Bryant for right now, but... I didn't understand a word you said. Razorback Car Wash and Bryant. Razorback Car Wash. Okay, for right now. Yes, ma'am. Actually, whenever I get back, I'm going to be in the heat and air business. I've already got a job. Great. And you're going to stay in Benton? Uh, me and my fiancé are trying to figure that out now. You're 19 and you have a fiancé? Yes, ma'am. You don't have any children, do you? No, ma'am. None expected? Uh, no, ma'am. We were pregnant, but we had a miscarriage. 19 is too young to have any children, sir. You know, you have to find something else to do other than drink and make babies. Yes, ma'am. You know, go to the library. <laughs> do they have a library in Benton? Yes, ma'am, there actually is. I've been there quite a few times. Have you? How yes, many times? Uh, I'd say whenever I was in school, about almost every other weekend. You mean when you stopped going to school, you stopped going to the library? No, ma'am, I started working a lot. Well, but you still have time. You had time to get drunk, sir. I would suggest you spend your time in the library. You had time to make a baby, right? You had to have time to go to the library. There are other things that you can do. Yes, ma'am. Other than drinking and procreating at age 19. You can expand your mind, expand your horizons. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Galvin. Now, you don't really want to tell me that it was the bike's fault that it fell down because it was parked in the wrong place, do you? Well, you really want to tell me that, Mr. Galvin? You look like such a nice young man. I have... Misguided, perhaps, <laughs> but a nice young man. I have pictures of the spot where my car was and his bike right behind it. Yeah. Like, it is a one-person parking spot. But I was on my way around... I was on my way around the car whenever I tripped over it. Mr. Oryk says that when he got to the party, you were sitting outside on your car. Uh, no, actually, I was inside talking to Danielle. No, you weren't, sir, because you were too drunk to know what in the world you were doing. Well, I mean, if I was that drunk, well, how come the cops didn't brought me in? And in the police report, anywhere, it Why doesn't say... Why would they do that? You weren't driving. I told him not to. Shh. Okay. You weren't driving. He didn't want to get you into any trouble. That's not my question. You know how much you were drinking. Well, at least at the beginning, you knew how much you were drinking. I, did you end up staying at the house? Yes, ma'am. Actually, I did, and my belt was stolen. Just a second. <laughs> you ended up staying at the house. Yes, ma'am. Where did you sleep? In the bed with the girl that I was seeing at the time. This was in May? Yes, ma'am. Was it the same girl that you're affianced to now? Uh, no, ma'am. It's not. <laughs> so between May of 2006 and now, we have had a new fiancé and an almost baby. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, ma'am. Listen, you paid $3,500 for the bike, according to you, maybe, more than a year ago. Yes, ma'am. You want $4,200 to fix it. That's not going to happen. Do you understand? Can I explain why? He yeah, sold, sure. Um, the guy sold it to me for that because he was scared of it. He said he was going to get put in jail or killed on it. It had always with the work in it. It's got a crate motor, it's been lowered, you know, custom paint, custom exhaust. It's a, you know, it's a pretty much a show bike. So it's worth more than 3500 is what I'm trying to say. Can I see the estimate to fix it, please? Yes, ma'am. There's uh, two parts estimates and two paint estimates in there. There's the damage. What kind of work do you do, Mr. Rorick? Um, I work for AutoZone, but I'm a full-time uh, college student as well. Where'd you get the money to buy this? I worked hard for it. Like uh, I had a dirt bike that I sold for it, and uh, I just, you know it's hard work. Oh, it's a beauty. Thanks. I mean, I wouldn't get on one of these things. <laughs> I like to have a whole bunch of steel around me. Yeah. There are a lot of crazies on the road. Yeah, there is. You know, so I like to be in a Sherman tank when I'm on the road.
But I know that a lot of people like these things, including my husband, who lusts after one. Really? He'll continue to lust after one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mr. Galvin, where are you going to be next weekend? At my house. No. Where are you going to be next weekend? The library. The library, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Judging for the plaintiff in the amount of $4,200. That's all. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. You may step out. Like I said, I tripped over it. I'm pretty sure it's just an accident. We're still friends as far as I know. No. And now the next case. All parties in the matter, Davis versus Jimison. Step forward, please. And it is your claim that when he found out that you were involved with his then-girlfriend, he vandalized your car. Mr. Peterson says, I didn't do it. Right. When did he vandalize your car, sir? March 23rd, but it happened. I didn't find out. It happened until the 24th, the following morning. Tell me the circumstances surrounding him vandalizing your car. That day we got home from work. I, uh, Who's we? Me and Jennifer. I went to her apartment. It was probably around 11 to 12 that, that night. When he came, I was inside with her sister watching television. I heard him arguing. The door comes swinging open. I see her flying to the side. and. He comes rushing in, and at the time, I'm lying on the ground watching television. They just moved into the apartment, and um, he runs up with his hands balled in the fist, uh, facial mannerism, just like, you know, very aggressive, and uh, I can tell he wanted, you know, to fight or something like that. So I stood up. Had you ever seen him before? No, I never saw him never in my met. life. So you never stood up? The guy. So, yeah. And when you stood up, what happened? Oh, when I stood up, uh, his whole mannerism changed real right. quick. <laughs> I was like, what's the problem, you know? And at this time, I started taking off my watch. And he looks at me, he's like, oh, I just want to ask you a question. So we walk outside. What were you and, taking uh, your watch off for? Well, you know, uh, I just, I want to know what time it was, man, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Why were you taking your watch off? Well, it was a nice watch, and I just didn't want to mess it up. So, okay. Well, yeah. So anyway, um, he follows me outside, and he asked me, what's the deal between you and Jennifer? And I asked him, I was like, well, do you know who I am? He was like, no. And I was like, well, I don't know you either. And uh, is Jennifer your girlfriend? And he kind of like paused and hesitated. I was like, is Jennifer your girlfriend? And he was like, uh, well, I was like, well, dude, you know, I don't know you don't know me. You have to ask her. And I left him out there and I went back inside. Had Jennifer told you she had a boyfriend? She told me that she broke up with, this, with him uh, around December, January, that like he was assaultive, would hit her and stuff like that. She just got tired so of it. So she told you at the time she was... She invited you over that yeah, she didn't she, have a boyfriend. Yes. Um, we had been, we known each other for probably two or three weeks before I had ever been asked to come over to her house. It had been like a month before I even came over there. I started working uh, where we worked okay. at in January. Now tell me about the vandalism to your car. Okay, well, after I left him outside, he did come back in again. He, he came back in and uh, told her that he wanted to grab his stuff. And she was like, well, you don't have anything here, but whatever, take whatever you want and leave. After he went upstairs, taking whatever, he was uh, up there for a while. When she went back up there, they started arguing again. I got tired of it, and I got up, and I was like, look, is there a problem? And that's when he left. He finally left. And then uh, Jennifer and her, and her sister watched him through the window. Don't tell me and, what they saw. I'm sorry, man. Jennifer, uh, what did you see? Um... After he went outside, my sister and I were um, looking out the window. At that point, I seen him like walk around the car, and it looked like he was just dragging his finger along the sides of the car. And um, he just walked around the whole vehicle, and then I seen him just walk away and get in his truck and leave. Did you tell Mr. Ari what you had seen? No, I didn't tell Sean at that time because I didn't want them to fight any longer. And my little sister was there, and I didn't want her exposed to this. And I knew what you know how upset Sean was about the whole thing and how much more he would be upset if he knew that Billy was anywhere around his car. Well, when did he find the damage to his car? Um, that following morning, ma'am. Um, did I'll you see stay him. over that night? Yeah, she asked me to, because she said she was scared. So. And when you went out in the morning, what did you find? A nice little decoration around my car. Can I see it, please? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Did you speak to him about it? Right after um, we called the cops and Sean and the cops left, um, I received a phone call from a private number on my cell phone, and it was um, Billy. And he was um, asking me, how's your friend's car? How's your friend's car? 
and saying like if I was to say anything it's going to happen to my car and that I was his and I would always be his and no one else's. I hung up and he continued to call me back on private numbers and I went ahead and called the cops. Okay, I'll hear you. On March 23rd I went over to see uh, Jennifer Gifford who is now my ex-girlfriend. She's my girlfriend at the time. We talked about our relationship for the simple fact that um, I had just helped her move into this home. Um, it was actually supposed to be me moving into the home, but it didn't turn out that way as her sister moved in. Uh, at that time, we were just discussing our relationship. She asked me what was going on, asked her if everything was okay between us. Um, basically, I was expressing you know, like my love for her. She seemed pretty apprehensive to really speak to me at that point. She seemed just not her usual self. I have dated her for about three, three and a half years. You knew before that that things were not right, Mr. Peterson, because he was supposed to, according to you, move into this apartment together. She had been in this apartment for a month, and you weren't living with her. So mm -hmm. you knew something wasn't right a month ago. Well, I have a child. I do How old is the child? Three years old, and that was a complication at hand. So you knew that things weren't right between the two of you for at least a month. Um, she actually lived with me in my home, and things were good. We didn't have any complications. When she moved into her own place, mm -hmm. and you weren't living with her, you knew that something wasn't right. Yeah. Okay. So what did you go over there for at such a late hour? She received a diamond ring from me. March, when I went over the 23rd. When did she receive a diamond ring from you? Christmas. Okay. Okay. When I went over there the 23rd of March, discussing issues in regards to our relationship, this gentleman here, the plaintiff, exited the doorway, asking me who I was at that time. Now we got myself, this gentleman and her outside in a very awkward situation. I asked her, who was he? She didn't respond. He asked me who I was, and I told him. You know, what did you tell him? I said, I'm her boyfriend. Who are you? Hey, why you went over there so late, sir? Well, because usually I, I stay the night there, and I had stayed the night there like several days prior to this circumstance. Did you take the engagement ring? Yes. Get to what happened when you left. Um, she actually, during, out, during the time that we spoke outside, all three of us, me and him didn't come to any terms of agreement whatsoever. We didn't, we didn't even discuss anything. I asked her if this was the way it's going to be, if I can get my belongings. She allowed me to enter the house. I went and got all my belongings. I shoes, pajamas, had the ring. I walked downstairs holding all my, my belongings. And this gentleman was waiting there by the door. And when I walked by him with my stuff, you know, he had just, he basically, quote unquote, said, the next time we meet, you know, it ain't going to be nice. Closing the door at that time, you know, slamming it, saying, you know, it was an indicator like, you're not welcome here. So at that point, I got in my vehicle. I left home. I heard from Mrs. Gifford the next morning. She contacted me. She said, you know, Sean is, is accusing you of messing up his car. I said, I didn't do anything like that, okay? And you should know me better than that. We were together three years. I never did anything like that. So... Basically, that's, that's how it went. And What uh, do you think keyed his car? I don't know. It's a new neighborhood, so I, I really wasn't sure. Like I said, I, I'd, I'd made sure that, um, you know, when I moved her in. Who are you? Excuse me. I'm Billy's mother. My name is Anna Peterson. Do you know anything about this case? Uh, I know some. Jennifer Gifford called me that next day, and she said, I think Billy keyed my friend's car. And I says, why didn't you call us and say, Billy's over here, there's a problem? She had no response. I replied, you know us for three years. You know we don't condone any kind of negative behavior. She proceeded to cry and say it wasn't supposed to be like this. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I said, no, Jennifer, you've been in my family for three and a half years. I've come to love you, and it isn't supposed to be like this. Okay? So prior to that, the day before, she had come to my home with my grandchild. Now, if they're not a couple, what is she doing with my grandbaby? She's come to my home the, the day prior to this happening, this incident. She has my granddaughter. I sit down and we have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I said, Jennifer, how are things with you and Billy? She says, we are working things out. I said, are you dating a certain individual? Not, not this gentleman. She replied, no. So at that point, I didn't feel there was a problem at all because they had still been seeing each other. She had okay. been with us in March. Jennifer, I have a question for you, dear. Yes. You didn't tell... This gentleman, uncross your hands. You didn't tell Mr. Ari? Yes, ma'am. About what happened mm -hmm. that night. He stayed all night. Correct. Correct. Now, private number called. Yes. And you say you spoke to Mr. Peterson. Correct. 
and then he kept calling. Mm -hmm. And you kept taking the phone calls, or did you let it go to voicemail? I took a couple, and then I stopped. I called the cops. They came and took a report and went and spoke to him and told him he needed to stop calling me and that if he came back to my house, he would be arrested for trespassing. Did the police tell you stop, to stop calling her? Yes. They contacted me uh, through the telephone, and they said that, that Mrs. Gifford has stated that you and her are not going to be in a relationship anymore, so please do not have any more contact or show up at her home. I said, yes, sir, but not a problem. What would make her call the police, Mr. Peterson? I believe it lays down a foundation in which um, there's no pertinent evidence in which can be held against me in this predicament. I mean, given, given the circumstance at hand, I've been accused of, of vandalizing a car, and she asked me the next morning if I was okay. Listen to me, Mr. Peterson. There are only two people that could have vandalized that car. One was you, and one was Jennifer. Now, if Jennifer had a sick pathology, she could have said, listen, when he's sleeping, I'm going to go out, I'm going to vandalize his car, I'm going to key his car, and then I'm going to be able to get rid of Mr. Peterson once and for all because he's going to stay away from me. She would have to be pretty nutty to do that. But those are the only two people, in my judgment, going to do it. Her sister wasn't going to do it. Her sister doesn't care whether she's seeing you, whether she's seeing him. She doesn't care. I just don't see her doing that, Mr. Peterson. Judge Judy continues in a moment. And later today... I told them they could go down there and play with the foosball table, but they were to not touch anything that was Mark's and to stay away from the motorcycle. Any of you children touch the motorcycle? No, oh, ma'am. Real cases, real people. Judge Judy. Sean Ari says his girlfriend's ex, Billy Peterson, vandalized his car by keying it. Billy admits he was angry, but claims he didn't do it. You certainly had the opportunity to key his car. And after what you discovered that evening when you arrived at her house, there's no question you had the inclination to key his car. You weren't going to fight him because after he stood up, you figured... You aren't going to get the best of this deal. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so what's the next best thing to a young man's heart is his car. What kind of an estimate did you get to fix your car, sir? The cheapest one was to cover up the, just the scratch without painting it, the whole car. So... Mr. Peterson, in civil cases, courts have to decide not beyond a reasonable doubt, that would be a criminal case as to whether you were guilty of vandalism, but whether there is more evidence than not, by a preponderance of the evidence, more evidence than not, as to whether or not I believe you keyed his car. Mr. Peterson, I believe you keyed his car. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $2,200. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. Parties are excused. You may step out. When you date someone for a while, they may end up cheating on you. It's basically what happened to me. And they kind of got together and orchestrated the plan. We didn't start dating until just recently. So, you know, and that happened in March. He was threatening me and um, making it a jokingly manner of how my friend's car was. She got caught, and now she don't know what to do about it. Where I'm from, we don't scratch guys' cars. So, you know, me and him aren't from the same town. I'm just glad it's done and over with, and we don't have to deal with him anymore. Like I said, it just goes to show, be careful who you date. Music. Be prepared, served as the Boy Scouts. Model the Scout Code varied outlining. That a Boy Scout should embody traits. Like reliability, loyalty, helpfulness. Friendliness, politeness, kindness. Obedience, cheerfulness, thriftiness. Bravery, cleanliness, and respectfulness. Surprisingly, it also mentioned naivety. Apparent stupidity, idiocy, and trust Nick had no alternative explanations. Typically after checking his wife's iPhone email, he refrained from further exploration a habit she knew well thus, foregoing extra security measures being a Boy Scout he respected others' privacy. However, with Nick's wife departing in a few weeks, he struggled to recall her hotel's name despite her prior mention hoping to avoid arguments about his inattentiveness which had become more frequent their impending separation. 
would be their longest since their wedding five years ago and they contemplated a romantic gesture like sending flowers to express his affection while she was thousands of miles away in the city of love Paris yet he knew her affections in Paris would be for Duane her companion on the trip upon entering his wife's phone password their wedding date Nick found himself perusing one of the non-word rated emails exchanged between Linda and Duane over recent weeks they discussed romantic activities in Paris including strolls along the Champel moonlit boat rides on the Seine and passionate at nights almost as startling as the affair itself was the fact that Linda and Duane exchanged messages using their work email accounts they both should have exercised better judgment like Nick Linda was a lawyer and Duane was a parlor at her firm all three had extensive experience in document analysis for major litigation cases where teams of lawyers and pargal combed through hundreds of thousands of emails for discovery proceedings typically the narrative revolved around one or two individuals engaging in affairs prompting lawyers to assess any impact on the case and strategize damage control the truth was Nick's lack of attention when Linda mentioned the trip and hotel name stemmed from a sense of something in Miss Honed by his legal experience in detecting deception he couldn't pinpoint it then but is instinct signal trouble five years as a lawyer listening to clients and colleagues had sharpened his perception something felt off when Linda first mentioned the trip the arbitration process ahead promised to be dreadfully dull leaving no time to enjoy the of Paris she mentioned this casually without even looking at him and it felt too dismissive knowing Paris held a special place in Nick's heart they often discussed visiting together since Linda had never been Nick found her response odd but he didn't anticipate such a dire situation the email he was now reading felt like a sharp blow to his heart Duane's message from the previous night suggested removing Nick to spend more time together without worry Linda replied stating she felt safe with Nick but admitted to enjoy enjoying secret moments with Duane this revelation stung Nick felt uncertain about his next steps aside from forwarding all correspondence to himself and printing out the email exchanges evidence just in case as an experienced lawyer is first instinct was to preserve evidence after securing the emails Nick began to contemplate his options he knew he needed to think carefully before taking any action this analytical approach was what to find him as a lawyer he was paid for his intellect not his physical strength with Linda out for a run and expected back soon he had limited time to make decisions before he could consider his next move he needed to complete the task of finding a hotel however this wasn't for sending flowers he didn't understand why he needed this information but he knew it was necessary perhaps to be near the Eiffel Tower close to the International Chamber of Commerce where Linda and Duane would be working on their arbitration case once he located a suitable hotel Nick quickly conducted a search on Virginia divorce law while he remembered some details from the bar exam he wanted to double check infidelity was grounds for divorce and could impact issues such as alimony and property division but there were nuances to consider one defense was if Linda discovered the infidelity and then resumed carnal relations voluntarily Nick needed to leave the house quickly avoiding confrontation for now intending to confront Linda later with a carefully 
crafted response he resolved to take. Control of the situation for the remainder of their marriage even if it meant acting against the principles of the Boy Scouts in wartime as Churchill famously said truth must be protected by a bodyguard of lies Nick's lies would serve a greater purpose now especially since none of them were under oath he headed to the master bedroom beginning to pack swiftly finishing promptly he placed his suitcases near the front door he nearly completed gathering vital documents bank and credit card statements 401k and ira statements car titles pay stubs mortgage and linda's recent student loan balance as he emerged from his basement office he heard her in the kitchen deciding to appear worn out and disheveled when facing his wife with her shoulder length brown hair pulled back into a ponytail she looked attractive though he found her repulsive in his view love was already dead i'll be going to paris he announced with a grim smile linda's face drain of color her blue eyes losing their brightness what paris virginia her initial shock faded quickly sven just called nick explained we're needed for an insurance case and we need to prep a witness we lost the motion to compel and the judge is furious throwing the investigation timeline into chaos i'll be on the road for a few weeks though i might drop by occasionally poor thing linda replied with a fitting expression of concern maybe your company is hiring i'd rather join you in paris nick countered noting concern flicker across her face again but then she grinned send me your resume maybe you have the right experience for us to consider it was a just linda's law firm ranked higher than nick perhaps with some guilt she moved as if to hug him but nick retreated to his office before she could close the gap visions of striking her resurfaced and he wasn't sure he could keep them at Bay heading back upstairs Linda inquired about his dinner preference I won't be able to stay I'll grab something on my way out Sven urgently needs me to hit the road he said bustling around the kitchen Linda followed him to the door a hint of concern in her expression as he grabbed his suitcases and headed out she leaned in for a goodbye kiss apologies I think i may have caught a cold this morning my throat feels sore it could be allergies but i don't want you to catch anything linda trailed him to the car as he loaded it when can i expect you back probably not until friday we're heading to roanoke after paris then the following week we're off to baltimore perhaps growing more paranoid he thought he could discern the ears turning in her mind as he watched her avert her gaze as though contemplating how his absence might present unexpected opportunities for a waving goodbye he reversed out of the driveway he hoped she would simply assume that he was preoccupied with work and irritated by the saturday call his acting skills were already stretched thin but he suspected she was already plotting to invite Dwayne over Nick drove until he reached a nearby shopping center with a coffee shop like many lawyers he found clarity in putting thoughts to paper as he finished his coffee he began jotting down a list of tasks pausing for a moment he realized he had never entertained the idea of reconciliation that wasn't even on the table only retribution was the question was to what extent the ringing of his phone interrupted him not recognizing the number he answered impatiently yes he said mr buford i'm sam granger though we haven't met i'll be direct i found your number online i specialize in buying old houses and replacing them with mansions i understand it's controversial but people tend to soften when presented with a check granger spoke rapidly leaving nick little time 
to react except to note that the house wasn't old it was cozy I'd like to purchase your house to demolish it. Granger continued while I'd suggest a shopping center construction timelines. Especially with county permits are unpredictable I make my profit by closing deals fast and I believe I can offer you a very favorable price if you and your wife are interested in selling Nick struggled to suppress a grin reminiscent of the Grinch's ass. Linda picked out their home shortly before their wedding although unaged. Ranch had boasted a charming yard bordering a wooded area with a babbling creek despite its proximity to major highways it offered seclusion and tranquility what truly sold her was the treehouse in the yard opposite the master bedroom window envisioning it as an ideal space for children meanwhile nick was drawn to its affordability and the fact that it was only a 20 minute drive from the main subway parking lot coupled with with a 30 minute train ride to work making the move to the area highly convenient mr granger i'll be absent for the next few days so access to the property may not be guaranteed call me sam i don't require an interior inspection as mentioned it's a wreck and i've already surveyed the exterior can we meet sunday morning certainly i'll likely finalize the deal using my wife's power of attorney due to her busy work schedule no problem i'll provide you with the necessary paperwork nick made a of the address and started to envision the plan taking shape did linda feel secure with her boy scout little did she know that lord bay and powell scouting principal stealth cunning and self-confidence served as the basis for his boy movement skills akin to military intelligence tactics including ambushes she won't anticipate what unfolds until it's too late but first reconnaissance to start he set his empty coffee cup on the table and headed to the car for privacy dialing a number he asked frank when the call was picked up frank barry worked as a private detective during his five years in corporate legal work nick also made it a priority to do pro bono work to assist disadvantaged individuals with their legal issues disaligned with his beliefs about leading a meaningful life and provided him with courtroom experience that is regular job typically didn't offer one of his law school peers suggested that frank assist with a contentious divorce case involving a stepfather accused of carnally abusing his stepdaughter frank's evidence led to the man's release when the police is lackluster response failed expediting the divorce process as nick briefed frank on what he had uncovered he queried you think your wife will bring him to our bed tonight is she truly that arrogant she's become incredibly arrogant to stand out in her law school class she believes she's infallible i'll handle it myself i owe you for your help the rivera divorce case brought me significant positive attention my phone hasn't stopped ringing thanks frank nick added oh and there's a treehouse in the backyard that you might find useful its windows directly face the master bedroom and she tends to keep the curtains open and used to bother me but i've learned to accept whatever arouses her you can access it by crossing the forest and jumping over the stream after dark there are no fences or dogs around a service road on the other side offers parking thank you if it's okay i plan to conceal a camera outdoors aiming it at the front of the house to monitor arrivals and departures excellent and you're engaging fray divorce correct you're seeking a divorce yes and yes all right i know harry's fondness for affidavits and the reporting process if you're correct 
We'll discover the truth soon next Nick. Phone Harry is disregarding the law. School reunion Nick I've already received five calls about contributing to their fund. No, I need to retain your services. Linda's been unfaithful and I want to pursue legal action after briefing him. Harry replied, come by tomorrow. Although it's Sunday, I still need to handle some paperwork at the office. We might as well proceed. It seems you've acknowledged that infidelity cannot be tolerated. Frank has already gathered compelling evidence of the affair. The challenge will be negotiating a fair financial settlement. She's also a lawyer at a prominent firm, so she'll have the means to contest and delay. Additionally, colleagues at her firm are advising her leave it to me. Nick said, I believe we can resolve this in a civilized manner, so you're not planning to go all out against her, but understood. Let's see what you propose is final. Call required finesse. Hello, Maggie. It's Nick. The silence on the other end was profound. Maggie, it's good to hear from you too, honey. After all these years, what's on your mind, Nick? After all this time, I need your assistance. I thought Linda was your assistant. It's about Linda. She's been up to no good. What a shock. I find it hard to believe foolish. Have you noticed that all of this is encapsulated in quotation marks? I can't offer you emotional or carnal support. Lately, I'm seeing someone else now, and I'm sure he's content. Look, I truly apologize. I regret that our indiscretions tainted our friendship. I also regret allowing Linda to push you out of my life when there was a chance for us to reconcile. But now I need your Supportive assistance. What do you need, Nikki? Informed her there was a pause on the line, followed by laughter. I mean, she said once she had composed herself, though he could still sense the grin in her voice. You always, always knew how to make me laugh. Thank you, Maggie. Once things settle down, you'll have to introduce me to Mr. Lucky so I can commend him on his excellent choice and. Invite you both to dinner. Consider it arranged. She replied. He required a place to lay low for a while and strategize. Thus, he booked a room at an extended stay hotel outside the Beltway Inn, Fairfax, distant enough from his end. Linda's usual hangouts to avoid detection. After settling, and he went out to grab a bite to eat. Although he wasn't particularly hungry, he knew he needed. Sustenance in his stomach to handle the drinks he intended to consume across the street from the hotel stood a restaurant named El Mariachi. As the hostess seated him in a booth, he noticed the bartender glancing in his direction. The bartender seemed vaguely familiar, but Nick dismissed the thought. At present, he had ample reasons to be concerned. The menu items suggested that the restaurant. Masqueraded as Mexican cuisine, many Americans couldn't discern the distinction. He opted for budget-friendly tequila with meal, anticipating a harsh hangover the next day. Considering the discomfort part of the purging process, the waitress returned with a bottle of premium tequila from the top shelf. Catching Nick's gaze, she gestured to the bartender, who nodded in acknowledgment. Nick reciprocated the gesture and poured himself a generous drink as the bartender resumed tending to other patrons. It took a moment for Nick to recall his identity. He remembered him as one of the spectators at Rivera's divorce trial and the subsequent criminal proceedings. Always seated alone in the back row, one day his clients' daughter Sonia hugged him, but when Nick. Inquired about the man, Sonia grew silent, insisting he was just a family friend. Nick dined quietly, jotting notes on a notepad and sipping tequila. After the waitress cleared his table, he visited 
the restroom feeling the surroundings. Sway as if he were aboard a ship leaning. Against the wall for support he returned. To his booth attempting to maintain. Composure only to find the bartender. Seated across from him sing your Nick Good. To see you he greeted clasping Nick's. Hand and shaking it vigorously Nick. Settled and awaiting his words I never. Properly thanked you for helping my. Cousin deal with that scoundrel she was. Waited to Nick try to downplay his. Rolled but the bartender brushed it off he. Was severely injured in prison were you? Aware I was they fear he may never walk. Or eat solid food again the bartender. Slight smile sent a shiver down Nick. Spine I didn't catch that Nick remarked. The bartender shrugged yesterday's news. What brings you to El Mariachi solo on a Saturday night where's your lovely wife? Nick met the bartender's gaze the bartender maintained a smile not mocking. But knowing Nick wondered why he posed. Such an odd question how did he even No, Nick was married then Nick recalled. Linda's surprise visit to one of the hearings where she kissed him afterward. The bartender must have still been in the courtroom wet dealing with some issues regarding her Nick admitted he saw no need to fabricate or conceal death. Details such as her involvement with someone else again met with the bartender knowing smile Nick was taken aback and fell silent I'm no lawyer Don. Nicholas, but I know that if you want to keep a secret, you shouldn't write it down and leave the paper lying around. The bartender remarked, gesturing to Nick's notebook, it detailed aspects of infidelity depicted drawings of Duane's hypothetical demise, featured the name Linda encircled with a slash and included a to do list with the phrase. Burn the underscore underscore Nick shrugged poor operational security, but at least it didn't expose any sensitive customer data any man in your predicament should ponder his desires. What do you truly desire in your Nick apart from wealth? What would be your ultimate vengeance? Nick didn't hesitate. I want to punch your nose so hard it shatters and I want to strike. Her face until both her eyes black and she has a stunning face and expressive eyes. I want to obliterate them the bartender's grin widened followed by a chuckle and a shake of his head my friend. Your thinking isn't rational those who seek revenge so viciously often end up behind bars you wouldn't want that. Unless of course it happens while you are Visiting your client's right, he paused, casting a sly glance at Nick, who nodded. But perhaps I can assist you with something you aided my cousin with her. Predicament she could have sought my help, but for various reasons she declined it. You stepped in and handled it. Nick attempted to interject, yes, he enlisted Frank to gather evidence in, but he left the police to do the leg. Worknick also enlisted a partner from his firm of former assistant United States Attorney to diplomatically liaise with the prosecutor to ensure proper handling of the criminal case. Nick accompanied his client to ensure she received due respect from the prosecutor. The divorce itself was standard procedure following her husband's conviction. The bartender waved off his Objections you must recognize that. Aiding everyday people like my cousin is. Commendable on behalf of my family I am. Indebted to you I always repay my debts. I believe you could use some assistance. Nick studied him intently I'm afraid I. Don't recall your name the bartender. Smile morphed into a shark like grin. Some folks call me El Diablo Devil he. Not if that's what those who dislike me. Call me to my friends, I'm Jose Garcia. Now it was Nick's moment to grin what? Must I do to earn a favor from the devil? Trade my soul, El Diablo's grin faded. 
Nick's expression turned serious. Let's be real. You're a lawyer. You don't have a soul. His grin returned, signaling a jest. Consider it professional courtesy, senor. Nick, now just provide me with your address, your wife's name, and her daily routine. What's your plan? I have a few ideas, but ever heard the saying? Ignorance is bliss. I think you need to remain blissfully unaware and keep track of your whereabouts over the coming months. Get yourself a disposable phone so we can stay connected. Leave the number here at the bar and after that. Steer clear of this place. It's for the best. Nick briefed El Diablo on hiring a private investigator. His intention to stay put until Linda jetted. Off to France and her travel schedule. L. Diablo recognized the hotel in Paris, but kept its source under wraps. Just one query, Senor Nick: Is there any hope for reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy? I don't want a year. I've had a change of heart. Later on, El Diablo met his gaze squarely. The grin vanished. His demeanor turned grave. Nick held his gaze, took a deep. Breath and paused to rein in his emotions. The path ahead was clear. He was a man of simple values, prioritizing trust and loyalty above all else. They had left his marriage. Linda had flicked a switch in his mind, swapping love for loathing. With time and reflection, he knew he'd eventually become indifferent. But that time hadn't arrived yet. No one. El Diablo eased. All right, don't stress about a thing. The waitress delivered the bill. El Diablo waved her off, but permitted Nick to tip generously. He also allowed Nick to take a bottle of tequila, but cautioned him to pace himself. A clear mind was essential for the upcoming battle. Somehow Nick woke up on Sunday morning at a reasonable hour with. Minimal hangover. He reached Harry's law office at ten a.m. and found Frank already present. Apologies, Nick. Frank said she definitely had relations with that guy in your bed. He was there too. Hours after you called me and was still present when I departed this morning. We received high-quality footage. I've made you a copy, but you might not want to view it. Harry interjected. You probably. Shouldn't don't worry," Nick replied, accepting the DVD from Frank. "Give me the summary." Frank continued. "I climbed into that treehouse just like you instructed, and they were all over each other. I captured clear shots of their faces and, frankly, their entire bodies. It was evident they were engaging in relations. Nonetheless, it seems to be merely physical. They hardly conversed." I'm uncertain if this alters your plans. No, for how long? Nick inquired. They both had remarkable stamina. Thank you. This only makes me feel worse. Apologies. Anyway, I'm personally acquainted with Linda from your party last year, so I can identify her. We ran a check on this guy's license plates. They belong to Dwayne Martin. We know he's colluding with her. The duration of their Involvement remains unclear, but it appears to be compelling evidence. Oh, and we've installed a camera in a nearby tree overlooking the driveway and garage, allowing us to monitor their comings and going. I'll send you a remote link to the live stream on our secure server. I've discussed this with Harry, and we'll draft a report and supporting affidavit for. Him to file once again. My apologies, dude. Frank exchanged handshakes with Harry and Nick before departing the office. So, what's the plan? Inquired Harry. Weir filing for divorce on grounds of infidelity, but I don't want to serve her. Yet Nick explained. Harry regarded Nick stoically. Trust me, Harry. Those words make my my stomach churn. I don't want any foolish moves. I have a feeling. Things will go smoother than you think," Nick reassured Harry. "Wince, just file this on Monday afternoon before the 
Court office closes, give me the case. Number and I'll handle the rest, but... Remember, Nick, I'm not versed in criminal. Law noted, and if you find yourself in... Trouble, I can't bail you out, you might. Be pleasantly surprised, Nick quipped as... He exited his next destination was A. Meeting with Sam Granger, it proved... Highly productive as Nick discovered. They could sell the house for over... $100,000 more than the mortgage without. Real estate agent fees Linda would be. Thrilled if she knew Nick pledged to. Return promptly with the necessary. Paperwork to seal the deal as Nick left. Sam's office he glanced at his phone no. Messages or calls she must still be. Occupied with Dwayne Nick seized the. Moment to call his boss Sven and inform him of his urgent need for two weeks of vacation or he would resign Sven in A. Panic relented re-recognizing Nick's vital role in current affairs and their temporary business slowdown with his plan set in motion Nick returned to his hotel to tend to his ongoing tasks by Monday evening everything was prepared. Linda had left voicemails on Sunday and Monday evenings to which he chose not to respond reserving his energy for Tuesday. Morning Frank's camera positioned outside the house had provided Nick with insights Dwayne had spent Monday night there and based on his prior stay from Sunday evening to Monday morning he would likely depart around 8 a.m. for work just before Linda left around 8.30. A.M. at 7 o'clock sharp, Nick strolled through the front door and exclaimed, Darling, I'm hold a sudden noise from upstairs caught his attention and shortly after Linda descended the stairs in her robe, appearing disheveled and startled, Honey, what a surprise, she said, attempting to feign cheerfulness but struggling to conceal her unease on the brink of panic. I thought you wouldn't be here until Friday, you didn't answer my calls. Apologies, Nick replied cheerfully, you. Know how it goes, he pretended not to. Notice the two glasses of wine left in. The living room as he made his way to. The dining room, Linda lingered in the. Doorway pondering her next move and how. To prevent him from ascending the stairs. Where Dwayne was likely hiding a knock. At the door startled her, could you get. That honey Nick requested meanwhile he busied himself arranging papers on the dining room table feigning obliviousness as Linda squared her shoulders and went to answer the door possibly anticipating the arrival of a bath with divorce. Papers to her surprise it was Maggie who entered unannounced simply greeting them. Linda observed with intrigue as Maggie took a seat at the dining table and opened her suitcase apologies honey Nick began but I'm uncertain when my next on air appearance will be and you know I can't imagine you embarking on a foreign trip without updating your powers of attorney you know just as a precaution in case any financial or medical emergencies arise oh and I had a couple of moments over the weekend and received a tip about refinancing my mortgage at a fantastic rate since we'll both be traveling I thought now would be the opportune time to handle it I apologize for the urgency he added attempting to convey his remorse who's this Linda inquired gesturing towards Maggie once the pulsing in her temples had subsided this is Maggie Nick clarified Linda Visibly relaxed Maggie is a notary Nick. Elaborated. You're my boy scout always prepared she. Remarked with a grin as she took a seat. Though her eyes remained cautious it's. Just my nature honey he said handing. Linda a pen and arranging the papers in. Front of her the flags with arrows. Indicate where to sign feel free to. Review the documents if you wish I trust. You Linda replied with a broad smile. 
promptly signing all the papers before. Her Nick silently prayed that she would. Comply as his fate depended on it, but as. They say fortune favors the bold as lent. Assigned each document Nick passed them. To Maggie who notarized them, Mrs. Buford. Do you have a photo ID, Maggie inquired. Linda rose from the table to retrieve. Her purse a brief exchange of glances. Occurred between Maggie and Nick both. Struggling to suppress laughter, Linda. Placed her driver's license on the table. Maggie snapped a photo with her phone. And recorded the details in her notary. Journal Linda offered coffee but both. Nick and Maggie politely declined as. Maggie finalized the certification of. The documents in her ledger and Nick. Organized everything into separate. Folders Linda's gaze remained expectant. Anticipating Nick's next move. Strategizing her next steps Maggie. Departed tidying up her belongings and. Offering Nick a smile when Linda's. Attention was elsewhere seizing the. Moment Nick informed Linda that he had a. Conference call to conduct and retreated. To his basement office to do so Linda. Visibly relaxed knowing she now had time. To discreetly escort Dwayne out and. Erase any trace of him before Nick. Resurfaced from his sanctuary. Nick descended to the basement allowing. Linda to maintain the illusion that she. Was still deceiving him pretending not. To hear the heavy footsteps retreating. Up the stairs as Dwayne made his escape. Or the garage door opening for Dwayne's. Departure Nick continued with his. Charade however upon hearing the shower. Running in the master bathroom Nick. Swiftly gathered his belongings exited. Through the basement door and drove off. In silence leaving his unsuspecting wife. Behind two hours later after a hearty. Breakfast at the diner Nick found. Himself in Harry's office Harry appeared. Taken aback so you're saying you had. Your wife signed form CC. 1106 confirming the divorce filing and. Relinquishing future service of process. And notice of any proceedings that's. Correct the properly certified form is. Right here and you're also telling me. That you coerced your wife a seasoned. Lawyer into signing a property. Settlement agreement transferring all. Proceeds from the sale of your home and. Its contents along with cars and any. Jewelry she owns granting you full. Control over her personal belongings and. Allowing both of you to retain your. Respective retirement accounts with no. Alimony from you to her despite her. Higher income indeed she always. Displayed a very generous demeanor Harry. Scrutinized Nick and redirected his. Focus to the papers on his desk and you. Also procured her signature on an. Affidavit wherein she confesses to. Infidelity acknowledging her lovers. Presence in the marital bedroom at the. Time of signing following a night of. Closeness the previous evening are you. Suggesting her affidavit genuinely. Supports this account according to the. Email she mentioned staying with her. Lover due to his proficiency is this the. Narrative you wish to present counselor. Nick maintained a neutral expression. Struggling to contain his emotions leaden. Refrain from insults the documents are. Self-explanatory Harry glanced at the. Papers then at Nick almost smiling. Before suppressing it and swiveling in. His chair damn it I'll accept the case. You're a respected member of the NN. Old friend from law school how was I to. Know you orchestrated all this I thought. It was legitimate, your honor, I'm utterly. Bewildered, I was blindsided by my. Client's breach of trust, if anyone's. License should be revoked, it's Nicholas. A Buford, your honor, do you see my. Stance on this Nick, I'll pursue it to. The bitter end, if need be, will the. Notary affirm Linda's signature on these. 
documents, yes, she will. Can she testify to Linda's careful review of the papers? I wouldn't wish to preempt or sway any testimony, but given Linda's legal expertise, I trust she scrutinized the documents diligently. I'm confident the notary will attest to witnessing Linda Buford review and sign each document as for her comprehension of their contents. I cannot offer an opinion. All right, then, said Harry. I'll process all this today, along with Frank's affidavit and report, complete with photos and a DVD. I'll attempt to remove it from the electronic record temporarily. We don't want this to remain in the public eye, do we know? Replied Nick Land is departing for Paris. In just over two weeks, the longer we keep. It concealed the better do you have any connections in district court, remember? Seth asked Harry he was a student a year. Junior to a struggling to secure a position at a law firm he's now serving as a law clerk in district court to bolster his resume he could expedite the process, but if the judge insists on live testimony it could jeopardize everything. Linda must decide not to contest this. For some reason should she become aware. If take a turn for the worse I may need. To resign is your attorney fair enough. Someday you can fill me in on the whole. Ordeal but not now over the subsequent. Two weeks Nick kept Linda at a distance. He sent her texts at irregular intervals. Citing his busy schedule and only. Sporadically answered her calls as time. Past her calls dwindled you spooked. Her Frank informed him by week's end. According to our surveillance footage. Duane hasn't been at the house since. You surprised them on Tuesday morning I. Can't ascertain if they rendezvous at his. Place during the week or engage in their. Activities at the office but it's. Evident they're avoiding home I'll keep. You posted if anything changes the only alteration was Nick's discreet return to the house upon learning Linda had departed to gather the financial documents he deemed necessary. He also finalized a contract with Sam Granger to sell the house with the South set to close during Linda's initial week in France. During evenings Nick frequented the gym. Read in his spare time and pondered how he ended up with such a chaotic life at 30 he informed Sven of his need for a few more weeks of rest to which Sven reluctantly agreed she's back to enjoying herself with him in the house. Frank informed him on Saturday a week before Linda's Paris trip thanks for the heads up Nick replied though indifferent. He knew he'd rather incinerate the Sheets then sell them when he abandoned. The house by then Nick had already. Viewed the video Frank provided. Revealing Dwayne's allure Dwayne a few. Years younger was a gym regular known. For pre-weight training mirror rituals. Otherwise unremarkable Dwayne embodied a. Superficial ideal Nick could have done. Without before he knew it Linda embarked. On her long-awaited Paris trip, one of Frank's associates shadowed her to the airport waiting until her departure for Europe. Upon receiving the news, Nick entered the house, consolidated Linda's clothes in the living room, and packed his belongings the next day, Merce boxed Linda's clothing and sent it to storage, while Nick's possessions were moved to the apartment he secured with Sam. Granger's assistance a proficient house. Liquidator Nick easily sold the furniture once the house was empty. Nick took a final stroll before executing his ultimate task he meticulously gathered the wedding photographs album and Linda's wedding dress placing them in the patio fire pit beneath the treehouse after adding lighter fluid and igniting a match he Watched as the memories turned to ashes. After the blaze Nick was satisfied to. Find that the video captured ample. 
Detail each photo added to the pit. Depicted vivid memories of their time. Together the following day Nick. Finalized the sale of their family home. Using his wife's power of attorney which. She should have reviewed with a separate. Financial power of attorney Nick managed. To deposit the sale proceeds access is. Personal account acting on behalf of his. Wife and close joint accounts three days. Later, however, during Linda's initial. Week in France, a construction crew. Demolished the house clearing debris. Swiftly before commencing site. Preparation, unfortunately, the tree wants. A playground favorite for children had. To be removed, a gazebo now stood in its. Place regrettably construction halted. Abruptly as the cherished home site. Transitioned into an empty square of. Land it appeared there were issues with. The permitting process Nick and a law. School friend employed in the county. Permitting department were confident the. Issue would resolve upon Linda's return. From France once the appropriate forms. Were received and approved throughout. This period Nick ignored all attempts at. Communication from Linda as showing calls. Texts, emails, and voicemails despite. Outreach from her friends and relatives. Nick replied swiftly informing them he. Was occupied in traveling primarily to. Deter them from driving by the house and. Encountering him El Diablo reached out. On Nick's prepaid cell phone mentioning. That Linda and Dwayne appeared strained. And unhealthy hinting at possible. Suspicions when Nick inquired how he. Obtained this information El Diablo. Simply stated his wide network of. Connections even across Europe he then. Proposed returning Linda's wedding and. Engagement rings to which Nick declined. El Diablo asked if someone else could. Purchase them to which Nick adamantly. Refused but eventually relented. Suggesting he might know a potential. Buyer two days before Linda's scheduled. Return from Paris Nick found himself in. Harry's office I have no idea how this. Happened but here's the divorce decree. It's much quicker than usual for such. Cases Harry remarked with Seth remaining. Silent I don't inquire or speculate. Consider yourself fortunate and. Celebrate your newfound single status. Here's the copy I'll be sending to your. Ex-wife I'm sure she'll be. Pleased as Nick approached his car. Outside Harry's office and unfamiliar. Number rang his phone however upon. Answering he recognized El Diablo's. Voice Nick you should take a vacation. Immediately go somewhere crowded where. People know you and can vouch for your. Presence with that El Diablo. Disconnected the call Nick realized it. Had been ages since he saw his college. Friends in New York fortunately his. Schedule was open for the next few days. So he embarked on a trip the same day he. Visited several exhibitions explored. Numerous museums and socialized over. Lunches coffees and dinners with. Different groups of friends covering. Most expenses with his credit card he. Also tipped generously at his hotel to. Ensure recognition from all the staff. While there he expressed mailed a DVD copy. Depicting him burning Linda's wedding. Dress an album to her parents. House late Sunday evening after savoring. Coffee and pastries in Little Italy and. Manhattan Nick's phone rang it was his. Father-in-law Nick where are you Linda? Is in a frenzy she's in the hospital yes. What's the matter this was becoming? Intriguing she returned from her trip on. Friday but she and her colleague were. Apparently abducted from the airport. They emerged this morning both under the. Influence of medications her colleague. Was severely smacking and Linda here his. Father-in-law's voice faltered what? About Linda she woke up covered in. Tattoos from head to toe. 
tattoos with dreadful inscriptions, and... As soon as she woke and saw this, a masked man entered and struck her nose. Breaking it then, he inflicted two black eyes with two more blows. Impressive Nick pondered it was the perfect ending. He wouldn't mind if Linda realized his betrayal just as she betrayed him in their marriage. It would be worth a soul. If he possessed one, I'm sorry to hear that I'm out of town presently. What do? You need me to do Nick sense surprise. On the other end of the line, you're her. Husband, she's your wife, not anymore, we. Divorced the court, finalized it last. Week, she's cheating on me with the man. She's traveling with what out here. What's unclear, Nick knew he was being. Excessively cruel now, but he didn't care. I have a video I can send you a copy of. Her engaging in bed acts not with me if. You'd like to know silence followed on. The other end, Nick wondered if his father-in-law had suffered a heart attack were done with her, so you'll have to bring her home. She's not my responsibility. Now you did it, his father-in-law exclaimed, I have been in New York since Wednesday celebrating my divorce. Look, I understand you're upset, and I hope Linda recovers soon, but I don't think we have anything else to say. To each other, he ended the call at that. Instant Nick realized the urban stress had become overwhelming. He emailed Sven, bluntly stating that he and the firm could go to hell respectfully. A quick online search revealed an REI story in Soho prompting Nick to equip himself with new hiking and camping gear since. Linda never enjoyed hiking. This was an opportunity for Nick to reconnect with his intelligence background the hotel kindly stored his luggage for a reasonable fee allowing him to venture into the Adirac Mountains to immerse himself in nature until things settled down fortunately he had his passport in case he decided to visit Canada as it turned out he did for the next eight weeks Nick mostly ignored his phone initially the barrage of messages residential resembling frantic screams and tears made it seem like someone had hijacked his ex-wife's phone unable to sift through them all he listened to only a couple before deleting the rest along with numerous bizarre emails clearly her account must have been compromised finding time to read through it all seemed impossible Nick hoped the troubled woman behind the messages would seek the help she urgently needed. Eight weeks later, Nick met Frank and Harry for drinks just to clarify. Harry began once they were settled that terminated our attorney-client relationship right after I provided you. With the divorce decree, I notified you via registered mail. Perhaps you haven't checked your email yet. Nick admitted he Hadn't it's quite a storm, buddy, remarked. Harry Frank added more like a typhoon. I'm all for it, plenty of havoc, Harry. Finished his bourbon and ordered another. Frank began detailing the events so on. Monday morning, the former Miss Buford arrived at her previous residence with her parents we never got around to, removing the external camera upon seeing. The empty lot she experienced a complete breakdown falling to her knees in tears and assuming the fetal position it culminated in her kicking and screaming like a toddler at the mall by late afternoon later when a work crew arrived she had another outburst despite having raccoon eyes from the sleeping and a band-aid on her broken nose Harry then took up the narrative that afternoon she along with a couple of attorneys from her prestigious firm stormed into my humble office in a threatening manner since they had no appointment I kept them waiting for 25 minutes I ensured my Glock was loaded and placed on my desk thank goodness for Virginia laws after the wait they all yelled at me discussing urgent motions bar complaints and contempt proceedings 
I must confess it was hard not to notice. The tattoos all over her face vividly. Ink and red and blue for visibility. Once I managed to regain focus airy. Continued I inquired about the exact issue causing their aggression asking if there were any false statements. They paused exchanging glances so I questioned them about the controversy surrounding your ex-wife's alleged infidelity they all affirmed it I then played a video I had prepared while they waited for Mrs. Buford showing her engaging in bed activity with someone other than her husband in the marital bed clearly they hadn't thoroughly reviewed the entire case file yet Harry continued then they all just appeared perplexed Linda started screaming that you didn't even give her a chance to explain herself and I responded saying you weren't concerned about the reason you just took action she regained composure and began arguing that she Never consented to you selling the house. She questioned the rationale behind burning her wedding dress photos and albums as they were her personal belongings. I presented her with copies of the powers of attorney one, specifically granting authorization to sell the house. I showed her the property settlement agreement granting you discretion to dispose of her personal belongings and reminded her she was fortunate to retain her clothing I inquired whether she disputed her signature on the documents while she admitted it was her she insisted she hadn't agreed to the contents then I questioned if her defense rested on her failure to read what she signed I prompted her to envision the scrutiny during cross-examination if she Challenged anything in court she fell. Silent at this point I also referenced. The affidavit she signed acknowledging. Her lover's presence upstairs at the time. Of signing and asked if this was. Accurate she then lost consciousness her. Companions attempted to revive her but I. Had already dialed emergency despite. Their insistence she refused to. Accompany them to the hospital however. She began shouting about tattoos in her boyfriend being assaulted. Harry added I clarified that these matters were unrelated to you as far as I knew you were out of town anyway. I suggested that perhaps Dwayne had provoked a husband either of another woman he was involved with or someone who felt Linda was taking him away. I informed them they could address any pie criminal case. With the Fairfax Police Department then. Things took an interesting turn Harry. Continued they persisted in discussing. Filing a motion for reconsideration and. Similar. Actions that's when I informed them that. Earlier that morning I had received an. Anonymous email containing links to. Several videos of Linda and Dwayne in. Your bed engaging in bed activities. Before their trip to Paris, the message threatened to distribute the videos to everyone Linda knew asserting that you, Nick, were unaware and powerless to do, prevent it they claimed to be allies, citing past assistance from you and pledged to shield you they warned of, sending the videos that day if she didn't drop the matter are you aware of. This I was out of town, Harry, afterward. They departed I haven't heard from them. Since and there were no incidents at the courthouse Frank resumed they likely contacted the police because a couple of detectives arrived they requested copies of the videos and filed a report then. Their interest waned neither Linda nor Duane could provide details they only recalled getting into a taxi at the airport then waking up in the hospital. Linda discovered herself in a CD hotel room having been assaulted before seeking medical attention in the room charges along with room service and many bar expenses were billed to her credit card this time Nick mentioned that the 
hotel manager had informed him that new York police had investigated his stay, and his New York acquaintances had been approached, however, they all confirmed his active presence in the city word on. The street Harry mentioned is that your ex is aged up in her parents' basement. Getting laser tattoo removal the snag is. They charge by the square inch and she's ink from head to toe it's bound to rack up tens of thousands of dollars and yet the marks will linger. Indefinitely it's regrettable Nick. Remark Harry fixed his gaze on Nick. Frank simply pressed his lips together. To stifle laughter, what about your? Paramore Harry took quite a smacking. Harry queried Hewns in for extensive. Physical therapy why suffered some head. Trauma multiple concussions he might. Struggle to land another parlor gig. Their firm cut ties with them both seems. Their relationship soured during the. Trip and somehow it adversely impacted. The entire arbitration they were. Ill prepared short on documents unready. Objections problematic witnesses they. Lost on the merits client wasn't pleased. Firm had to make some personnel. Sacrifices to salvage future work one of. These days Nick you'll have to divulge. How you handled all this Frank suggested. Handle what I'm as innocent as a boy. Scout Maggie waited in the car as Nick. Disembarked I'm a bit peeved no one. Bothered to inquire if I actually. Notarized the documents or if she read. Then before signing I was prepared to. Testify that I witnessed her. Scrutinizing each one but I couldn't. Gauge how much time she spent on it. Let's hash this out over dinner I owe. You and your boyfriend for aiding me and. Regaining my freedom Maggie turned to. Him peering over her sunglasses as Nick. Backed out of the parking spot there's. No guy you dummy Nick break suddenly. Meeting her gaze seriously absolutely. Now zip it and drive me home so you can. Commence the rather lengthy and grueling. Process of making amends sure thing Nick. Grin but first I need to swing by the. Post office for what sending a card to. An old friend Nick replied retrieving it. From the glove compartment it bore the. Boy Scout's emblem I'll ask her does she. Feel safe now. Applause. Safe. Music. Applause. Music.